All right. Good, good, good morning, everyone. I'm Oliver Gilbert, um, the vice chairman of the Miami-Dade County Board of County Commissioners and the chair of the Miami-Dade TPO and the chair of Tech. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this workshop this morning. I know it says that I'm gonna have 10 minutes to speak, but I'm not taking 10 minutes because I think that we all know why we're here. We're, we're here to review the, the type of transportation, the type of regional transportation needs we need and goals that we have and how we can actually best um, learn, understand and work together. Uh, I appreciate everyone who's in attendance. I appreciate my colleagues on the board and now I'll turn it over to them to, to introduce themselves. Mr. Vice Chairman. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, Beam Fur with Broward County. And Member Pinto. Mayor, are you on? I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? We can, yes. Okay. Fred Pinto from Palm Beach County. All right. Good morning, you all. And I see next on the agenda is... Uh, Commissioner Bean, this is where looking at my phone becomes the issue. The right next, next should be Broward Workshop, uh, Randall Vitale. There you go. I'll help you out here. <laughs> sure. So, uh, Chair Gilbert, if you if you don't mind, let's do a little house cleaning for our 150 attendees. Okay. So I just want to let everyone know that we are recording. We are recording this. The recording will be made available af after the meeting. All the presentations will also will also be put up after the meeting. And for those who have, when we get to the question and answer section, which will happen during our break time, uh, to please use the Q&A section. We will try to answer as many questions live as possible. But for those we don't get to, we will record it and we'll get back to you with an email or some other f follow up throughout. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I see Chief Morales well, is on here. Hi, Jimmy. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning. All right, so now we're on to um, Greg from the Broward, Broward MPL. Greg. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint. I'm not Greg, not I'm Greg Stewart this morning. Sorry, Ms. Mr. Cross, we're, we're going to back up a little to uh, Mr. Vitale. So for those oh. of you who don't know, Randall Vitale is the president of Hoffman's Chocolate, previously spending 17 years in banking as a market executive lead, leading teams throughout South Florida. In the community, Randall currently serves as a co-chair of the Transportation Committee of the Broward Workshop, chair of the Transportation Surtax Appointing Authority, chair of the Coastal and Coalition in Broward, and co-chair of the Transportation Pillar of the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance Prosperity Partnership. Okay. He's going to open this up with a few words in the business community. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. If I had known that that whole thing would have been read, I was gonna would have made it a lot shorter. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> that Good, was the edited version. Good morning. <laughs> but that was very much the edited version. Good morning, everybody. Um, as mentioned, I'm Randall Vitale, and I'm here representing the Broward Workshop and the business community at large in South Florida. Uh, Broward Workshop is a 40-year-old organization that is a private nonprofit nonpartisan group of over 100 business leaders and decision makers here in Broward, Broward County. We represent tens of thousands of employees, and we want to uh, encourage everyone to uh, be engaged today and participate in this uh, incredible discussion. And we know how important it is, not just for transportation and congestion, uh, but also for economic development and uh, for housing and so many other things that a great uh, commuter rail along the FEC line will provide. Uh, a little bit about the Coastal Link Coalition, which you'll see uh, in the, uh, on, the, on the PDF there, uh, BrowardWorkshop.com slash rail is where you can learn a little bit more about the Coastal Link Coalition in Broward. Uh, this is an organization that was started by Albert Garcia with the Wynwood Business Improvement District in Miami. And we've now taken it up to Broward and our responsibility is singular in focus. And that is to, uh, so many business groups are focusing on so many topics and uh, myself included, but this group, the Coastal Link Coalition is really singular in focus. And that is advocacy to make sure that this project continues to move forward so that we can have commuter rail 
on the FEC line throughout South Florida. And so there are over 50 organizations, uh, businesses, cultural organizations, and uh, great organizations like the Miami Dolphins who are in the middle of the NFL draft right now, uh, and so many other organizations that have committed to this initiative. And if you'd like to learn more about it, go to BrowardWorkshop.com backslash rail and sign up to get our updates. And I'll be sure to reach out to you and see how you can get engaged. So with that, I will turn it back over and look forward to hearing from all the great panelists today. Thank you very much. Thank you. So next up, we have Bill Cross. He is the Deputy Executive Director of Planning and Policy for the Broward MPO. In this role, he's responsible for the long range multimodal transportation planning, transportation programs, city services, and data services. He is a professional engineer registered in the state of Florida and holds a bachelor's degree of science in civil engineering and a master's of business administration. Mr. Cross has over 25 years of progressive public sector management experience. Mr. Cross. Okay, well, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, I am uh, standing in for Greg Stewart, our executive director at the Broward MPO. Uh, he was unable to attend this morning due to another conflict, um, but I'm certainly pleased to, to stand in for him this morning. Uh, and, and of course, some of you um, may or may not know me in my history, but uh, I spent um, much of the last 10 years uh, over with, with TriRail. So um, the irony is not lost on me that I'm going to provide you a little history of this project this morning uh, since I was right there, witnessed uh, much of it. So next slide, please. Uh, and we'll continue on. Okay, so again, I was, I was asked to provide the group just a little bit of history so that uh, as we're thinking about where we want to go, we can understand uh, where we came from. So let me start all the way back, uh, really at, at kind of the, the beginning of the development of Florida. So, uh, you know, this is not a new idea, providing passenger rail uh, on the Florida East Coast. And it actually, um, by 1894, there was already rail service down to West Palm and many of you there from Palm Beach, I'm sure recognize the breakers. Uh, this was uh, one of the hotels that Flagler built on his system. Next slide, please. Um, and so, you know, I, I wanted to start at this point because I think many of the things that um, were really compelling for Flagler back in the day are, are the same reasons why this is a good idea today. Um, you know, passenger rail obviously has a role in, in transportation and in moving people, um, but it goes beyond that. Um, a key element for Henry Flagler was opening up land and the land development uh, that goes along with that. Uh, and then of course, there was an economic motive and still today, uh, there's large economic rewards uh, associated with the development of passenger rail in this corridor. Uh, there was a study done, it's probably almost 10 years old now, uh, but it showed literally a couple billion dollars worth of economic activity um, would, would come from a project like this. Uh, and finally, there's an issue of equity. Uh, I think that's on, on most people's minds today. And we know that this corridor serves a whole series of historic downtowns uh, that uh, some are economically underserved areas and, and they would too benefit from this type of service. Next slide, please. Okay, so, uh, you know, it, bringing us forward to more modern times, you know, when did this really get started? Well, it was back um, in the early 2000s when there were a series of studies that started out in the corridor. Uh, Palm Beach started to look at maybe extending tri-rail up on what was known as the Jupiter extension, which would require crossing over onto the FEC rails. Uh, Miami-Dade, back in 2002, passed their half-penny sales tax, the pennies, uh, I guess it was the People's Transportation Plan. Uh, so they started thinking about and looking at what they called the Northeast Corridor, which is the FEC corridor. Uh, and so, and, and others started to look at this corridor as well. And at the owner at the time, uh, of the FEC corridor asked that all the different government agencies look to consolidate these studies into a single regional study. Uh, and so all the MPOs got together along with DOT and agreed that DOT would be the right party to lead that overall 
regional study. Next slide, please. So for the period from 2004 through 2010, uh, this is really the time when DOT was studying uh, and, and developing an overall system master plan. Uh, you can see here DOT held over 400 public meetings. Uh, there, there was a lot of outreach. There was a lot of work done looking at the corridor. And it wasn't just rail. They looked at all of the opportunities in the corridor at that time. And a couple key findings was that um, a local bus system up and down US-1 really wasn't the right solution for the longer regional trips. Uh, but that it was uh, supportive of keeping the bus service more local on, on US-1, but FEC could provide uh, a regional trip that was time competitive with the auto. And that was a key goal of the DOT study was to make sure that they were developing a rail system that could compete uh, from a time standpoint with an automobile-based trip. Uh, and of course they did a get resolutions of support from two of the three MPOs uh, for the results of that study. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this was also an important time, 11 and 12. Um, DOT came back and took kind of a second look at their master plan and realized that they had identified perhaps too many stations. I think there was over 50 in the original master plan. Uh, and most importantly, they came back and they focused the number of stations down to about 25 at that time. And that was a, that was a, a big effort to do that. Uh, also, All Aboard Florida at that time in that period announced that they were gonna provide service from Miami to Orlando. Uh, and then in parallel to that, SFRTA presented uh, a fast start plan for a tri-rail coastal service uh, to the SFRTA board. Next slide, please. Uh, 2013, I'm going to say, was uh, a, an important year in, in the overall study efforts. Uh, this was the point at which there was an overall memorandum of understanding agreed to by uh, both DOT, uh, SFRTA, as well as the regional planning councils, the three MPOs, uh, on how to move as a region the study forward. Uh, and so you can see there uh, that DOT was really left with the lead role for the early project development. Uh, and then RTA had different uh, roles, including trying to find the funding. Uh, and then the regional planning councils um, were leading the public outreach. Next slide, please. So from 14 to 18, um, again, there were some things going on, but I'm gonna say um, some progress uh, slowed a little bit in this period, uh, but the MPOs had initially um, approved uh, for DOT and SFRTA to request entry into project development with FTA. Um, but then shortly thereafter, uh, FTA and FRA agreed to put that on hold to avoid confusion with the efforts of All Aboard Florida. Uh, and then shortly after that, Brightline actually started their revenue service uh, from Miami to West Palm Beach. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also during this period, and, and I think it's sometimes forgotten, but RTA was able to successfully negotiate um, with FEC uh, access on their rail uh, corridor into downtown Miami. And while that service is not yet um, actually in place, uh, the agreements and the rail corridor access uh, is in place. So that was a very important thing that happened during that time frame. Uh, Miami-Dade, uh, continues to explore uh, perhaps just the Northeast corridor portion and moving that forward. Uh, and then most importantly here, I think, you know, I have to point out that Broward in 2018 passed a transportation surtax. Uh, and throughout the study history, the single um, most challenging uh, item to, to figure out and sort out was the funding. And not so much the capital funding because available grants and such, it was always the operating funding. So uh, I point out the surtax here uh, in Broward County because perhaps that finally unlocks that puzzle of the uh, operating funding. Uh, next slide. Uh, and I'll leave you here today as you get started on the rest of your conversations with a quote that we heard from FTA back when we were entering project development, uh, Coastal Link, is the best opportunity for a new commuter rail service in the nation. 
Um, I believe that probably still stands true today. So um, again, on behalf of the Broward MPO, uh, welcome. I think you've got an exciting agenda here in front of you today. Uh, and I hope this is the start of, uh, of a renewed interest in some great things to come in this corridor. Thank you. So we'll be taking questions after the next two presenters. Next up, we have Patrick Goddard. He is the president of Brightline, the first privately owned and operated intercity passenger rail system in over 100 years. He was responsible for the development and construction of the Florida system and bringing this innovative system to market. He comes to the hospitality industry, having worked in hotel development and operations for Hilton Hotels, Lowe's Hotels, and Rosewood Hotels. Prior to joining Brightline in 2016, Patrick was a president and COO of Trust Hospitality. We'd like to wel welcome Patrick. Thank you very much for the welcome. It's wonderful to be here. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, I might ask if you can pull up my presentation. Uh, there is an issue with my settings. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's go to the next, the first slide. Um, many of you are familiar already with Brightline trains and Bill, thanks a lot for giving the history. Obviously, these are train tracks that have been in place for over 100 years, about 125 years now, and really are the foundation for, you know, the state of Florida and all of the activity around the corridor. Um, we invested, you know, as, as Bill correctly pointed out, um, we really, uh, the inception of Brightline began in 2012. Uh, in 2017, we completed the construction of phase one, which was Miami to West Palm Beach, and we commenced operations in early 2018. And um, although we shut down uh, operations in March of 20, as a result of COVID-19, we look forward to reopening later on this year. Um, during the time that we've been closed, though, we've been busy at work enhancing, you know, how our operations are going to return. Um, and of course, we've been advancing all of our construction uh, between West Palm Beach and Orlando. Um, we'll have invested over $4 billion into the corridor. The, the portion between West Palm Beach and, and uh, uh, Orlando is 53% complete. And we expect to complete that by the end of 2022. Uh, also in 2022, we expect to open uh, additional stations in the cities of Aventura, a project that was uh, sponsored and funded by Miami-Dade County, and uh, an additional station in Boca Raton. Between both of these two stations are equidistant from our existing stations. Uh, so they, those both will open in 2022 as well. So we're very excited about that, and we're exploring an expansion beyond the Orlando airport, where our terminal currently is in Orlando, uh, to continue out to Tampa with a stop in Disney. So very, very excited about uh, all of these opportunities. And as Bill mentioned, we're bringing Tri-Rail into the downtown station. All of that infrastructure is complete. We're just waiting for, uh, waiting to get completed with uh, positive train control implementation on the corridor for us and for Tri-Rail. Uh, so all of that is very, very imminent. So looking forward to getting reopened. Um, I'm not gonna go back through the history here, um, but at a high level, there's been discussions about commuter rail on this corridor since well before I showed up. And um, we have had this dialogue ongoing with predominantly Dave and Broward uh, more recently um, about this topic for, I think, more actively over the last two years. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, I can, you know, we can, the project itself, many of you are familiar with, it's essentially five additional stations between the existing station of Miami Central and the planned station of Aventura. Um, we're, we're, we're progressing with the county. We're making excellent progress with them. I think that, you know, what we've realized is this is a project as well as Broward, and we'll talk about it in a second, uh, talk about Broward in a second, uh, that uh, 
you know, and again, the FTA have been quoted saying this as well. This is a this is a viable project. This is a probably one of the most uh, ideal uh, corridors for commuter rail implementation. You've got an existing uh, rail corridor, uh, an existing disturbed corridor. So from an environmental perspective, it's simple to implement. We're really just adding platforms and some additional infrastructure to be able to handle the capacity. Um, so we've got the framework of a deal uh, uh, established with Miami-Dade County and Broward County's deal is going to look very similar to this, but it's essentially um, our motivation is to, you know, essentially we're, we're looking to create more connectivity to our system. Um, there will be an access fee involved uh, for Miami-Dade County in lieu of them investing the, you know, billions of dollars that we invested into the corridor. We're essentially leasing capacity on the corridor to the counties to be able to utilize that capacity. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, there'll be a capital cost because we're going to have to build some stations, buy some trains, uh, and improve the infrastructure. And finally, someone's going to need to operate it. Um, we're fairly ag agnostic about operating uh, the system. And, you know, we know TriRail, uh, we feel we agree with TriRail. We think that there should be um, a, a combined regional operation uh, that so that people understand that um, this system and the tri-rail system uh, are interconnected. We need to make it easy for people uh, to live a car-free lifestyle and move from system to system. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, this is where we are with Miami-Dade County. We've done uh, a mountain of work over the last year and a half with them, including ridership studies, uh, RTC modeling, uh, we've gotten consultants involved in NEPA, we've been working on design, uh, we've developed track charts. Um, so this is progressing very well. What we're, what we're, where we're getting to now is sort of where the rubber meets the road. And, you know, Bill alluded to this the last time everybody focused on this. I mean, this is, this project has been brought to uh, almost the finish line on a handful of occasions. And in many occasions, it died under its own weight or its own under, under its own complication. This is why we're attacking it one county at a time, um, starting with Miami-Dade County. But we're at a point now with Miami-Dade County where now we need to figure out where the money's going to come from. And I think the uh, fact of the matter is that right now there is not a better opportunity to be able to do this. All of the stars have aligned. You know, we're in a position to have these discussions uh, right now because we've completed the infrastructure improvements for our system. Um, there is a willingness and a desire on the part of the county to do this. We're coming out of a pandemic and, you know, somewhat of an economic crisis, and there's no better way than infrastructure to kickstart the economy. Uh, we've got thousands of people moving into the South Florida region. We need to figure out a mobility solution for them. I-95 cannot get any wider and cannot take any more capacity. And we've got the ability to move, you know, thousands of people every hour up and down that north, uh, north south corridor. Uh, so really the time is now. Um, um, and that's what's most exciting about this discussion and getting all of these people in a room together or a virtual room, if you will, together uh, to talk about this important uh, subject. So next, next slide, please. Um, Broward, you know, is a little bit behind Miami-Dade a couple of months, but we've engaged now with uh, the county. And, you know, I want to thank, and going back to Miami-Dade, um, you know, Jimmy Morales and his entire team and the previous administration before him, you know, everyone's working tirelessly to make the, the, this happen. It does take a village to make these things happen. And similarly in Broward, uh, you know, Bertha Henry and I have been talking about this for a long time. She's been, um, you know, a leader on this initiative, along with Commissioner Furr. Um, there's been a lot of, you know, there's a lot of thought and time and effort that goes into selecting the station locations and thinking about the service levels. And, you know, we've got to also collaborate with the freight railroad to ensure that none of this impacts their business in a negative manner. So, um, uh, Broward is in good shape, uh, but a few months behind, uh, Miami-Dade County. And of course we have a significant, uh, opportunity in Broward. We've got the new river bridge crossing uh, that needs to be now, you know, that, that we can no longer put any more trains on. And therefore, how trains cross that uh, waterway is critically important. And I know others will speak about that today. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's important that we allow marine traffic to traverse the new river. That's an important component of the Broward economy. Uh, so ensuring that we create a crossing 
uh, for uh, for trains that is conducive to the marine community continuing business as usual is critically important. So um, FDOT commissioned a P uh, PD e that started at the end of uh, last year, beginning of this year, and that's well underway. And they're working in a very in an expedited manner to try and catch up with Miami-Dade uh, County. But again, it'll be a similar arrangement with Broward, whereby they'll pay an access fee to use the corridor. There'll be a development cost for the improvements, you know, infrastructure, platforms, and rolling stock, and then uh, an operator will need to be selected. Uh, but obviously, there need there there will need to be synergy between. Miami Dade and uh, and Broward, and although we don't want to combine the two projects and the two negotiations, because I think that that's how it uh, you know we kill a project like this. There does need to be some level of coordination in terms of what this ends up looking like and how it operates. And and clearly there will be economies of scale, you know, with Broward joining uh, Miami Dade on things like rolling stock and uh, repair facilities and headquarters and other sort of fixed overhead. Um, the more stations and real estate that that's spread over, the better. Um, and, you know, if Palm Beach is able to um, join as well, that would be, um, you know, that would obviously make that even more economical for the other two counties. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so really, our view is there's a ton of momentum, and this is just a rendering of what one of these stations might look like. Um, you know, there's a ton of momentum for this project right now. There's a lot of interest from the business community and leadership, uh, you know, from many in the in the uh, business community. We've got obviously uh, Randall Vitali with the uh, on on the Broward side, and we've got folks in Miami Dade County. I mean, there's a there is a lot of interest in making this happen for the community. Uh, people want to see this system for for moving their um, employees around, uh, moving tourists around, um, and just generally kind of creating better transportation options uh, aside from getting into your car. Um, you know, this is a moment where really all of the stars are aligning in terms of funding. We know there's going to be a TNI bill that's going to be a once in a generation TNI bill. Um, and that's the opportunity to make a project like this a reality. Um, so as a region, we truly need to get ourselves organized in order to uh, take advantage of those dollars. Let me just flip to the next next uh, slide, please. So, you know, we've got a phenomenal case to make to both Tallahassee and DC and um, um, on why these types of projects uh, are critically important at this time. Um, and we all need to work together to articulate that vision and that benefit to the region. Um, we, as the um, owner of the passenger easement on this corridor, um, stand ready to collaborate with um, all of the different groups that are on this call uh, and in this meeting today to, to make this happen. And as a private entity, you know, we are able to make some things happen uh, a little faster. We are uh, very focused on, you know, trying to get this delivered in a timely manner. We're prepared to roll our sleeves up and handle uh, uh, you know, everything from planning to construction to design. So, and again, our, our view here is this is an excellent time to try and capitalize on this. We, we, you know, there's, it's going to bring jobs. It's going to bring environmental benefits to the community. It's going to increase people's quality of life. Um, you know, we're going to provide access to environmental justice communities. It's going to improve mobility generally. Um, for our communities, which is critically important to our economy and its continued success. So, um, you know, we're here to facilitate this conversation as best we can as the owner uh, of the passenger easement. We think there's no better time than now to do it. And uh, we stand ready with our resources to try and make it happen. Thank you very much. So, Thank you, Mr. Goddard. So our, our next speaker, Stephen Abrams, is Executive Director of the South Florida Regional Transportation Authority, which operates TriRail. Stephen is a proponent of public transit because he is a product of public transit, having grown up riding buses and trains in downtown Philadelphia, and now is a regular TriRail rider for the past 10 years. Steve has a 30-year record of public service, including as Mayor of Boca Raton and Palm Beach County Commissioner, where he served as the first county mayor. We'd like to, to welcome Mr. Abrams. 
There we go. Thank you, Paul. You read that just like my mother wrote it. Uh, we are uh, glad to be part of this workshop on Coastal Link, formerly known as TriRail Coastal Link. And uh, we're assuming the designation has changed because the system is now, as Patrick said, being negotiated separately uh, by each of the counties directly with Brightline, which uh, is understandable because the counties have the potential funding sources. But the uh, Brightline, uh, or rather the TriRail Coastal Link vision, which was embraced by the three counties originally, uh, should remain and I trust will remain uh, the same. So what is the vision? On the next slide, uh, we see uh, a, the original system map for TriRail Coastal Link. And uh, we've seen some other maps and we'll probably see some, some during the course of this presentation. They're all similar with different graphics. But let me, let me go through this one uh, because here you see the two parallel uh, South Florida rail corridors. The line on the right is the FEC corridor. The line on the left is the South Florida rail corridor, which TriRail operates on. And, and most people think these are two separate parallel corridors, but in fact, they are interconnected. So at the very bottom of the slide, you see that white bar and that is the uh, connect the Iris connection at 79th Street in Hialeah. It's the crossover that TriRail will use to uh, go into Miami Central Station. Then at the north, uh, at the uh, top part of the of the slide, you see a, another white bar that is an existing crossover in West Palm Beach at Northwood. And then in the middle, the sort of the squiggly orange is uh, represents the planned. Uh, crossover in Pompano Beach. So the TriRail Coastal Link vision is for one interconnected, one seat commuter rail service. So thanks, thanks for the next slide. Uh, and in addition to that, we would say it would should be one operator and one brand. I mean, that's TriRail's main interest and focus in this. After all, TriRail operates the existing system and has done so successfully for over 30 years. The TriRail Coastal Link vision assumes that TriRail would operate the connecting system under the TriRail brand. I mean, it's, it is still called Coastal Link, so it should link to something. That's something being TriRail's existing service. And there are many obvious uh, reasons for this. Here are some, uh, first and foremost, to avoid rider confusion, I mean, getting people to ride transit is uh, hard enough uh, without having to confuse them with different train logos or names. We've all ridden transit in cities like Washington or Boston where you have a red line and a blue line and a green line. So can you imagine if they had separate operators or, or even different branding? Uh, second, uh, it, one operator will help preserve one seat rides. Multiple operators or e even different branding could mean that riders would have to switch platforms or trains. Every study in just common sense uh, tells you that that uh, deters ridership. We already have a two seat ride that we are seeking to eliminate with uh, getting into downtown Miami. Uh, with downtown Miami Link currently, you take tri-rail to metro rail transfer uh, and you get off and get onto uh, metro rail, a you know, different operator it, to go into downtown Miami we are replacing that with the one seat downtown Miami link ride. Uh, nobody would wanna just create another version of a two seat ride on coastal link where you might have to take tri-rail into uh, downtown and transfer. So uh, I think folks are pretty in agreement on that. And then thirdly uh, on this slide, one of my favorites is uh, uh, no need to create a duplicate bureaucracy. So as we've heard, Miami-Dade County is the furthest along in negotiating with Brightline, but Broward uh, is next. And I can assure you uh, from being from Palm Beach County, there will be some Palm Beach County envy soon following that. And Palm Beach County will be in the mix. Uh, and so as the other counties join the system, you would need to have a public entity to implement system-wide policies and protect the interests of each county. The SFRTA board is that entity already in place, already staffed and with uh, the rail expertise. On the next slide, uh, we have uh, last but not least, 
uh, that it would cost less uh, to run the system under the, the tri-rail flag. Tri-rail can leverage uh, our existing contracts and workforce with only marginal increases. SFRTA charges no management fees, no markups for subcontracting services. So what do I mean by that? Uh, the, take it from me, there's more to commuter rail service uh, than just running a train up and down the tracks. Uh, who will patrol and maintain the stations, address rider complaints. On the grants, we talk about wanting to fund so much of this using uh, federal grants. They are highly competitive. They are very specialized to write and to administer. So the question then becomes, would the counties add staff to do this, absorb it? Would they outsource to private uh, uh, consulting companies? Uh, tr these are tasks that SFRTA already performs. Uh, and then uh, finally, it will be more convenient and cheaper to use Tri-Rail's Hialeah Yard for both train storage and maintaining equipment uh, instead of uh, finding a site, building a new one, uh, or sharing the yard uh, with another separate uh, operator or maintainer of equipment. So finally, uh, combining it all into one, then uh, the Coastal Link vision, or if you want to change the name back to uh, Tri-Rail Coastal Link, and the Tri-Rail Coastal Link vision uh, is for one operator, one brand, for one interconnected one seat ride commuter rail service. Uh, the counties will get to decide the operator and the branding of Coastal Link. We stand ready to assist the counties uh, to complete a fully integrated system. And the, the result would be a, a true regional commuter rail, not a fragmented system that all of us taxpayers, visitors and riders can be proud of that would address the issues that uh, Patrick and others have raised pre uh, previously, which is to relieve traffic congestion. Already, Tri-Rail uh, takes the equivalent of up to one lane of traffic off of I-95 each and every day to continue to get our everyday workers to their jobs and students to school and to address uh, the issue of climate change here in South Florida, where we, we certainly are ground zero, 70% uh, uh, transportation is 70% of the oil barrel. And uh, if you're going to reduce the carbon footprint, uh, you should be uh, looking very seriously at expanding your, your rail network. Rail is the only mode that actually takes uh, cars off of uh, the, the uh, highways. So, as with the others, we stand uh, ready to, uh, uh, to work closely with you to see this come to fruition. And I look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank, thank you, Mr. Abrams. So chair, like any good rail system, we are running right on time. Uh, if we have any questions from our CEFTEC members, I'd, I'd like to invite them to go first and then we'll go to the audience. All right now, I'm still, I'm, I'm just listening, Paul. Mayor Pinto. So. Yes. Do, do you have any questions for our, our previous panelists? Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I don't want to share those questions right now. Um, uh, there's a lot of good information being put forth. Uh, I think the presentation that was just made by um, Ms. Abrams makes a lot of sense. And I, my, my question will be, you know, once we get beyond this workshop, if in fact we wanted to move uh, with, with a strategy to bring to fruition what he proposed, which I think makes sense on the surface, uh, what would be those next steps? So. Uh, is that a question to me or Mayor? Well, it's a rhetorical question. I don't expect you to answer it now, but I, it's something we ought to have some thoughts on and certainly offline, we can have more detailed discussions on, on what that would be. So th thank you, thank you, Mr. Pinto. So, uh, oh, sorry, okay. Mayor Pinto. So um, Mr. Abrams will we'll follow up with Mayor, Mayor Pinto on that point. I'd like to turn to the audience now. And for those asking questions in the q and I'd like to ask that you please in introduce yourself. Um, our first question is for someone who needs no introduction. This is for Mr. Abrams. So Mayor Josh Levy from Hollywood. 
asked, when will SFRTA TriRail start running train service at downtown Miami? Well, thanks, uh, Mayor, for the question. Uh, Patrick alluded to that in his presentation. Uh, really, we, we're working through a couple, two issues. Uh, one is uh, uh, finalizing the acceptance of the, of the platform that was constructed for uh, TriRail's use at Miami Central Station. But uh, the, the larger one is uh, awaiting uh, Brightline's uh, completion of installing their positive train control system. This is a federal mandate that was imposed on all the railroads, including TriRail, that I know that Brightline is working very diligently to complete. It's a, it's a, a costly and complicated GPS-based uh, collision avoidance system uh, that has to be in place uh, for them as uh, the host railroad, uh, whereupon uh, TriRail would be a tenant on their system and then would have to go through its own testing to satisfy the uh, Federal Railroad Administration that we, our system was interoperable, our PTC system was interoperable with theirs. So as I said, working uh, uh, very uh, assiduously to complete that uh, as soon as possible. And we have a follow-up question from Mayor Levy, which is when do we look, when does it look like we'll be beginning the Broward negotiations? Uh, I, I didn't hear that. When will we be getting the negotiations for the Broward portion? Oh, that's that's not my that's not my question. I can I can try and answer that question. Uh, how are we doing, Mayor Levy? So uh, it's ongoing. So we signed an MOU with Broward County, I think, towards the end of last year, and uh, the commission has initiated um, and. Uh, Commissioner Firm, I, you know, piggyback on here and add some color, but um, there's an appraisal underway, uh, which will help us value the corridor. The PD&E, which is being conducted by FDOT, which, and they're going to talk about that process, I think, as part of this presentation a little bit later on, uh, is underway. And part of that exercise is to do ridership studies, um, identify station locations, um, and also it's evaluating the different um, methodologies of crossing the new river, river bridge, including, you know, either a tunnel or there's three different bridge options uh, that will go over the new river. So, so the process is, you know, we're expecting the process is going to, you know, I think by the fall, our hope and uh, you know, I'll put it out, I'll put it out here uh, is that we're pretty close on finalizing the economics of the Broward deal. Um, Broward also needs some air rights, uh, which we're helping them to obtain from the freight railroad uh, to enable some of the other transportation solutions that are being proposed in that county. Uh, so that's kind of part of this as well. But, you know, the, uh, to answer the question directly, Mayor Levy, I think we're in the negotiations, we're in discussions. Um, you know, once we get appraisals in and station locations, we can actually start to speak about economics in earnest. Um, but, you know, the goal would be to have um, a more material or substantive uh, MOU or pre-development agreement in place by the fall. Commissioner Furr, you see it any different? Uh, no, I think, I mean, we're going to be covering that in just a, a few minutes, uh, all the decision points that we're going to need to go over, all the different planning, et cetera. So uh, Mayor Levy will, will cover a lot of that in just a minute. Okay. okay. And while we have a uh, Patrick... Goddard unmuted. Uh, there's a question for Brightline. What is Bright for Mrs. from sorry, Miss Sue Levin? Is Brightline looking to extend service to the Port of Miami? Yeah, so we've had a dialogue with the Port of Miami uh, for the last year or so. Um, I think we expect um, you know to re-engage with that community with that with with the port um, after the summer. Uh, obviously. One of the industries that was most impacted by the pandemic was the cruise industry. And as they start to think about how they're going to restart, uh, we're gonna re-engage with the port on, on negotiations. I mean, the good news is there's already infrastructure from the Florida East Coast Corridor across Biscayne Boulevard directly into the port that's being used by the freight uh, company today. So adding the infrastructure and placing a station, you know, are things that we've already discussed with the port. Um, so we know it's feasible. We know what the economics are. It's just a question of timing. 
Thank you. And then um, I have two similar questions from Mayor Rex Harden and then from Ms. McKibben Turner of Lake Park, which is what support do you need from the municipalities along the corridor in order to keep this project moving and, and going forward? So, I mean, the business, so I'm going to sort of answer this, you know, in two, in two ways. You've got, you've got the business community uh, and you have the, you know, uh, um, elected officials or the government municipal agencies uh, th that, that, you know, we deal with on a regular basis, you know, and then the, they're, they're, of course, the community at large. So, uh, and there's, you know, they're represented by a variety of different groups. I think that we get, I think there is a, you know, a lot of support for this project. I think, you know, it's very difficult to see any downside, frankly, on a project like this, something that creates more mobility, more mobility gets more cars off the road. Um, you know, so, so I think the local governments need more support in solving funding problems and more guidance on how to do it. Because I think there are a number of different programs that are available at a federal and state level. Um, there are also CRAs in certain communities who have money. Uh, there are local developers who want to get involved in some of these stations and develop TOD around them. So I think that it, you know, I said it earlier on, it takes a village to make these, these systems happen. And it takes a huge amount of coordination and leadership to pull all of these different groups together to figure out how to, you know, design, you know, plan, design, build, fund uh, a project with this sort of magnitude. Um, so, you know, uh, that's a long winded answer, but, you know, uh, to, to the, the, uh, the reader's digest version is it takes a village and it takes some ingenuity, creativity and resilience, um, and, and certainly some leadership. So we're working directly with, you know, um, the mayor, right? So mayor Kava and, and, um, COO of Miami-Dade County, uh, Jimmy Morales. So we're, we have a direct relationship with them on implementing this uh, system in Miami-Dade. And similarly in Broward, we're working directly with Bertha Henry. And I know Vince Ruddy is going to speak. I haven't, Vince and I haven't met directly yet, but I know you've met with some of my team and you've just started. So we're looking forward to engaging with him uh, as the chief negotiator for uh, uh, Broward. But I think the most important thing that we need is a, is a, capable and engaged counterparty. Well, Patrick, because, uh, if I could interject, you might point to uh, your relationship with the city of Boca Raton, where you know, you're building the addition of uh, Brightline Station. That, uh, of course, I watched that very closely, was a great example of a partnership between uh, Brightline and a municipality where you work together to obtain a federal grant and uh, to really uh, design the project that benefited uh, everyone. So, uh, you know, a feather in your cap for that. And that really is a, a model, I think, for how uh, we can work with the municipalities all along the corridor. Yeah, no, thanks, Steve. And Aventura is another example just like that, where, where we collaborated to create something, you know, where one plus one equals to three. So it is possible. It's, you know, but it, it, it you know, and, and kudos really to Mayor Singer in Boca, because he was an engaged uh, counterparty. And, you know, some of the challenges that we have, and particularly now because of the timeliness of, of you know, the availability of some of this grant uh, money, um, we've got to be, we, there are going to be dozens of counties and municipalities applying for grant money. Everyone's going to be after this money as it comes out. And he who is best prepared wins. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do is, is be the best prepared and put ourselves in the best position for this federal funding. And in order to be very well prepared, we need an engaged counterparty. And that's been some of the challenge we've had, you know, over the years is, is the interest in this project wanes from time to time or the focus does. And I don't think it's anybody's fault. I think that as a, you know, as a county, uh, whether it's Broward or Dade, you have a lot of other priorities and we've just gotten through on the other side of a pandemic and we have other things that we're focused on. But, you know, 
yes, we got to make sure that we're able to support, um, you know, the, as a county, the medical facilities in the in the region. Uh, but we also need to be thinking about the future, and we need to be thinking about the economic uh, viability of our regions for the future. And therefore, we have to be planning for that and planting seeds for when we come out, out on the other side of this. And I, I think a lot of us are starting to feel like we're coming on the other side of this. Um, and we need to ensure that we are prepared to capitalize on the opportunities that are going to be presented to us. Uh, and, and, and as I said, in order for that to happen, we got to have engaged counterparties. We're ready to work. Uh, we got to have engaged counterparties on the other side of the table. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. You answered a lot of questions in the chat about about funding questions. And while we have you, we're talking um, talking about expansion. Ms. Bolfin from the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance asked, where would Brightline be going after Tampa? And if you don't mind, I'd like to make that a two-part question. Uh, we have some interested parties who regularly commute to and from Tallahassee. And is Brightline making that inter-regional connection and then with Tri-Rail serving the intra-regional as aspects, how can we make those two systems work together so we can go freely throughout the state and then throughout our region? Can I get to Orlando first? <laughs> Listen, um, you know, these systems are, you know, not uncomplicated to uh, plan, design, permit, raise money for and build. And, you know, this, what we're doing now has been 10 years in the making, uh, which is like, you know, record speed for something like this in America. Um, we, 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 you know, we're, we think about, our business as being a service that replaces short short uh, haul flights, our medium haul flights, 200 to 400 miles, uh, cities that are that are heavily populated, that are two to 400 miles uh, apart, uh, too short to fly, too long to drive, um, and and generally on congested highways. So, you know, obviously the South Florida segment is a great example of that. Miami to Orlando is a great example of that. You know, South Florida to Tampa is a great example of that. We're doing a project out in the West Coast of the United States uh, between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. That's a great example of that. Chicago to St. Louis. Um, so that is, that's our business. That's the business that we're in. But what happens is when you build a big infrastructure asset like we are, people and people understand it, they start to look for ways to connect to it. And, 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 and also, as you expand it a little bit, just like Flagler, right? He kind of got it to Palm Beach and then it went from Palm Beach to Miami. And then it went, you know, well, now we're in Miami, let's get ourselves down to the Keys. And, you know, in retrospect, that didn't work out so great, but, but you know, man, I'd love, I wish there was a train down there now. Um, you know, these are phenomenal infrastructure assets are, are, are game changers, uh, but they're, they're expensive and unwieldy, you know, to, to sort of deploy uh, in, in, in a rapid timeline. Look, I could see us potentially going up to Jacksonville because there's already infrastructure that exists between Cocoa and Jacksonville. And so you could connect, uh, you know, from Orlando to Jacksonville or from Miami to Jacksonville. And that's becoming a, you know, a, a growth hub. Um, and we control that corridor. Going up to Tallahassee, there's unfortunately, you know, only a couple of months of the year that you could make that work. So um, as a private company, making that kind of an investment doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now. Um, and going down along the west coast of Florida and kind of making a loop, which has been another suggestion, uh, um, not only is there not enough population on that west, co west coast of Florida to make it viable, uh, it's also a bit of an environmental nightmare. Uh, to get down there. So, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of in and out of wetlands and waterways. So um, I think that, you know, getting to the Orlando station and getting out to Tampa meaningfully connects more than 50% of the state's population and also connects all the major destinations uh, around the state, all the major airports and all the major cruise ports. Um, I think that's a really, really good start. And I think that once we get that stood up, and people understand the value of intercity passenger rail, I think there'll be more interest from the federal government and others to make investments alongside of us. Up until now, we've done everything on our own. We haven't gotten any federal assistance with the exception of some of the grants we've gotten with Boca and Aventura, for example. But everything else we've put in, we've over a billion dollars of equity and we've raised private activity bonds to the tune of about $3 billion. So we've built this independent of any kind of federal handouts. 
And, and part of the reason why we closed our operation was because we weren't going to get any CARES money. So, you know, doing this as a private entity, we have to make money. Uh, and that's really what's going to drive our decisions for future expansions. So, thank, Paul, thank you. Paul, yes, yes, Commissioner. Can I, can I make a suggestion here? Uh, I know we have a, I know we have FDOT coming up and a few, and uh, our transportation uh, department and Vince. I'm looking at a lot of the questions that are coming up, and I think they may be dealt with in some of those quick discussions. Um, just as a thought. I, I think you're 100% right, Commissioner Furr. Um, we're going to move on with our next presentation with Jimmy Morales. And I agree, a lot of the questions in chat, um, if we get to them, they'd be spoilers for our upcoming presentations. So just sit, sit tight, and I promise we hope to answer as many of these live as possible. Okay, so I'd like to welcome Jimmy Morales, the Chief Operations Officer for Miami-Dade County. He was appointed by Mayor Daniela Levine Cava in November 2020 to oversee transportation and public works, amongst other departments. Jimmy is leading major projects, including efforts to expand and improve transit. He joined the county from the city of Miami Beach, where he served as city manager for nearly eight years. He previously served as city attorney for the cities of Doral and Marathon. Well, welcome to the stage, Mr. Jimmy Morales. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for that introduction. Uh, and uh, I'm actually also currently serving as the interim director of the Trans Department of Transportation and Public Works, although I'm hoping in the next week or two to uh, pass that task on to someone else. But uh, it's a pleasure to be here to present. Um, uh, you see our, uh, our slide uh, starts with what we call the Northeast Corridor. That's not because we don't agree with a coastal link uh, rail. Obviously, we, we think that's uh, the ultimate goal and, and look forward to being part of that process. But as some of you know, um, a few years back, the county, uh, uh, well, the TP. PO led by uh, and uh, current chair, uh, which expansion was going to go first. And at some point, folks had the wisdom to realize we could move a lot of them forward, maybe not all at the same speed. But we could move, uh, in this case, six different quarters forward, you know, through a 40-year funding pro forma, uh, and um, and the SMART plan was born. SMART standing for Strategic Miami Area Rapid Transit, um, and in fact, we are breaking ground now on the first of the quarters, uh, the South Quarter, which is a bus rapid transit quarter. But so the Northeast Quarter comes from its reference as, as part of the SMART plan. Um, and um, uh, if you can go to the next slide, uh, please. Um, as you can, you know, this is a little repetitive earlier. Obviously, there's been talk about, you know, uh, this quarter for a long time, uh, going back to 1993 uh, with the transitional analysis. Uh, obviously, when uh, Brightline uh, uh, came along, uh, you know, uh, they were looking to do the platforms, the Miami Central Station. It was a collaboration work with them to make sure that the, there were also platforms that could serve uh, a traditional rail uh, system. Um, uh, as uh, has been noted, uh, back in 2019, the county uh, worked with Brightline and agreed to pay $76 million to build a, an Aventura uh, station, a park and ride lot. And there's going to be a phase two that, in fact, will be a pedestrian bridge over US-1 uh, to go into the mall. And I know we're working with FDOT on that. Um, uh, just this past March, uh, the TPO adopted uh, a locally preferred alternative uh, of passenger and commuter rail technology for this quarter, uh, which you know I think is consistent, obviously, with what we're all talking about. Uh, and uh, and the Board of County Commissioners, who uh, uh, operates, you know, in a sense, oversees uh, the transit department um, uh, and forms a large part of the TPO, has also embraced both the smart plan and, and the support uh, for this. Uh, and I know Patrick uh, alluded to a lot of that, and uh, we've been enjoyed working. He's very enthusiastic about getting this project done, and we share uh, his enthusiasm uh, and uh, and uh, have been moving forward in that regard. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just uh, to talk a little bit about uh, how we view the Northeast Quarter, um, obviously uh, we have uh, what are the two links of the of Bright Line in Miami-Dade County, uh, the current downtown station, and then the Aventura station, which as you've heard will hopefully be opening next year. Uh, and in between then identifying, running a commuter service in between those two, lo those two stops uh, uh, with, uh, as you see here, weekday, 30-minute uh, headways during, uh, you know, uh, on peak, 
and then uh, our uh, off-peak, uh, same service hours as our Metrorail uh, fares, consistent with our transit system, uh, so that it would seem seamless to the person who's got, you know, one of our Metro cards or a, a senior who's got the Golden Passport, and the idea of having a park and ride at each station, uh, and um, so that's sort of our proposed uh, operating plan, along with this 13-mile corridor. Uh, obviously, uh, hopefully one day it would go north of Aventura into uh, uh, into this great tri-county region. Um, next slide, please. Um, we have been uh, in discussions uh, with Brightline since uh, summer of last year, but even during the pandemic, we've been working on this. And while no definitive you know, agreements have been entered into, as we're being cautious of obviously uh, potential funding from the FTA, um, we've really come forward with a, a framework that uh, we've talked about uh, in terms of the infrastructure and vehicles, the site work that's necessary, the track work that will be necessary, ident identifying the stations, obviously the locations of the stations is critical, uh, that, therefore to the work that needs to be done. Uh, talked about the need for maintenance facility, as was I know mentioned by uh, Steve Abrams and others, uh, the rolling stock. Uh, we have already, um, again, while not yet uh, sealed uh, by signature, we have come up with a framework for the access fee, as you see set forth there, uh, uh, in terms of the I love some upfront payment, uh, an annual payment uh, for an agreement. Um, and then um, uh, we are all obviously also looking at the operation. I'm, I'm sorry, payments. Mr. Morales. Uh, received, you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for interrupting, Mr. Morales. You, you sure. froze for a second, and we had several questions about the fee oh, and fair okay. payment. Do you mind repeating that line? Oh, I'm sorry about the uh, the access fee. Yes, sir. Yeah. No. The um, the uh, and it's, yeah, as you see it here on. The uh, slide be reflected by the uh, county commission is a uh, uh, an upfront hey, fifty million dollars payment. Uh, Jimmy, you froze yep. again when you started talking about the fee. You froze the oh, exact moment my, you started uh, talking about the fee again. Wow. Yeah, my, maybe God doesn't want you to talk about the I fee. Should, I don't know. Maybe I'll blank. Maybe I'll blank my screen. Is that can you hear me better now? We can hear. Okay. That's you're good now. Okay, maybe that's uh, um. Yeah, I was just saying that in, in a resolution adopted by the commission last year, uh, the framework for the access fee, uh, an upfront payment uh, not to exceed $50 million, and then an annual payment uh, of $20 million for an agreed upon term, I believe, of 30 years. Did I make it through that? Yes, sir. Thank okay. you. Okay, good. Yes. All right. Uh, and then the last piece uh, of the O&M, obviously, uh, we have uh, talked uh, uh, with SFRTA. Uh, in fact, Steve Abrams and I were talking this week about that and we've also had a proposal from brightline uh we've made no decision there but obviously uh cost is an important factor and the, you know the extent to which uh you know um for candidly sfrta could assist in keeping those costs low and and perhaps even uh for, you know help assisting with financing uh for such a regional service would be ideal next slide please um the uh the the, the locations uh for the stations um, the uh, commission has uh, uh, identified uh, by resolution uh, some top priority locations uh, in North Miami, North Miami Beach area around 151st, proximate to where we also have the North Campus of FIU uh, location uh, uh, in the vicinity of El Portal and in the design district. Um, those are three that are reflected on the map. Uh, we've also they asked us to look at some other locations. We've looked at Wynwood Edgewater, North Miami, uh, in the vicinity of 123rd Street, as a, which is a big transit corridor and the vicinity of Little Haiti. One of the things we, uh, we did earlier this year is we put out a request for letters of interest uh, from private developers uh, to see if they would be interested in a TOD, uh, Transit Oriented Development, uh, around a, a, one of those potential stations to, and to give us a proposal. Uh, in fact, we have received uh, six proposals uh, corresponding to those six stations and uh, we will uh, begin discussions with them. The idea is hopefully not just to have you know, significant transit-oriented development around those locations that will promote ridership, but also potentially uh, that those developers would uh, would see uh, to it to provide uh, funding uh, for the uh, the stations at those locations. Um, next slide, please. Um, sort of in a status report, we mentioned the Aventura station will be open by 2022. We have submitted an infra-grant application uh, to USDOT uh, for $125 million. We actually, uh, they reached out to that yes, uh, yesterday, in fact, 
I think, in a positive note to get some additional information uh, about uh, our application. So we view that as a positive. Uh, I think sometime in May or early June, we'll hopefully get a read from them on that funding. Um, I mentioned the RFLI, uh, that we've received the proposals and we'll be talking to those developers, uh, but some very serious projects that are involved. Uh, we will um, uh, be shortly submitting our NEPA checklist to the FDA uh, and, um, and are, are moving down that path. And, uh, and Patrick and Brian Lamb were very helpful in that process as well. Uh, obviously, that, that NEPA is critical, not only for potential FDA funding, but even also in our conversations with FDOT, something they, they need to and, and expect to see. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, uh, you, know, uh, I, uh, uh, you know, show me the money is always a critical piece here in these transportation projects. Uh, the funding structure uh, traditionally that we try to look at is 50% federal, uh, 20, and then 25% uh, from the state. Uh, we have submitted our letters actually for each of our quarters uh, to FDOT and hopefully we'll be uh, receiving a, a response shortly uh, for them to provide the 25% um, or 50% of the non-federal share. And then obviously a local a commitment as well. And you know we're uh, looking at for different ways to even finance that. Uh, the commission has been active in trying to create transit, uh, uh, rapid transit zones for TIF funding, et cetera. I mentioned the infra grant and we are at least keeping the door open uh, to CIG um, whether it be a new starts or even potentially a small starts, if we can get um, costs down to a point, maybe working with SFRTA and others, where it could even be a small start, which again would hopefully mean a, a quicker uh, a quicker process. Um, and next slide. Um, sort of next steps time frame. Um, uh, we anticipate the next year or so, uh, and plus uh, to be involved with NEPA and project development. Uh, we would be during that time period uh, proposing to enter into a pre-development agreement with Brightline to further refine the, the cost estimates uh, for the infrastructure along the corridor and uh, the specific locations of the stations will be important to do that, to continue uh, hopefully negotiating on the access fee, uh, assessing affordability, and leading to uh, an access and operation agreement, uh, and then ultimately a, a project agreement uh, for the designing and building of the infrastructure. We would view an engineering phase uh, from 2022 to 24, uh, with um, you know hopefully full funding. Uh, if sooner, great. I mean, you know, obviously, if we can get interest, uh, the infra grants done, we can get some um, guidance from FDOT, et cetera. If we can identify other funding sources, and we are going to be very. I think Patrick mentioned, uh, you, know, that, you know, we we all understand there could be significant dollars coming out of Washington um, out of this new administration, um, and so we will be actively uh, pursuing those uh, potential sources but always trying to keep our other options. And that's why we mentioned the FTA small starts process because it is, we are, the project cost here is teetering on that 300 million threshold. Um, and so um, uh, we're gonna keep that process, hopefully that option at least alive by going through the NEPA uh, and project development phase. Uh, next slide. Um, immediate next steps in the short term, uh, we're doing a mid-year budget amendment uh, that we'll be bringing to the county committee uh, to basically provide uh, a, a show of local funding, uh, $30 million to cover activity costs during this project development. Uh, we're going to be requesting to enter into project development uh, and uh, preparing the uh, uh, NEPA class of action uh, for the quarter. Uh, that, that'll uh, be uh, keeping us busy in, in the few months ahead and continuing to meet and talk. I think we meet almost weekly with Brightline to talk about these issues. And uh, next. Next slide. Um, and so, you know, um, uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Obviously, we would uh, we look forward to being part of a regional service. I mean, we all know that uh, that in the morning the traffic heading south, and in the evening it's the traffic heading north uh, among our respective counties. And uh, uh, so, uh, our workforce uh, uh, can, are sometimes are your residents, and your workforce sometimes are our residents. And so, uh, if we can create this regional corridor, but we. We believe that the time is ripe in Seattle, Washington. So we're moving forward on our piece um, because we've been told by FDA and others that it, it's a viable on its own, but we certainly, I think, in the long term, hope to be part of a regional system. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morales. While Mr. Miller shares his screen, I'd like to introduce the next four speakers. Beam Fur is Broward County Commissioner representing District 6. 
previously City of Hollywood Commissioner for 12 years. As an official, he has focused on transportation, transit, environmental issues, early childhood education, housing, economic opportunity, and the arts. Chris Walton has been the Director of Broward County Transportation Department since 2006. During his time at BCT, Mr. Walton was instrumental in establishing the first express bus service at downtown Miami operated by the agency and the nation's first countywide bike share program, Broward B-Cycle. Vince Ruddy, who just joined Broward County, has over 25 years of experience in technology, infrastructure, economic development, and public policy. He's ex an experienced negotiator who has worked in more than 30 countries. Steve Braun is FDOT's District 4 Director of Transportation Development. He's a registered professional engineer serving as an, an important role in the department by improving processes and delivering key projects ranging from complete streets projects to major interstates and bridges. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner Beam Fur. Beam, I think you're on mute. You're right. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to I want to say how much I think this forum and and using Ceftec. Uh, is really is a really good forum for this, and I and I, I'm one of the I'm the elected representative from Broward, and Oliver is from Dade, and Fred is from Palm Beach, and I think we, the three of us, probably think this is uh, a perfect forum to be able to discuss this. It's a formal um, place where we can do this and bring a lot of good ideas here. Uh, so I'm 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 thankful for that for us to be able to do that. Um, I know Bill had mentioned some of the history 125 years ago that the uh, uh, flag lord brought it to Palm Beach. It was on March 3rd of the next year that it got to Fort Lauderdale. And then 42 days later, it got to the, the shore of Biscayne Bay, 42 days. That's a pretty amazing timeline when you think back. Uh, hopefully we can kind of, uh, that, that's a uh, tough bar to, uh, to jump over, but that's something to go for. Um, and then it then that connected us all. 42, in 42 days, we were all connected. And we were connected for a long time, for almost 50, 60 years. And then we weren't. And so uh, 50 years later, it's nice to see, it was great to see Brightline bring back passenger rail. And now it's up to us to bring back commuter rail. Uh, the, the, uh, the slide that I believe um, uh, Brightline had put up showing all the reasons uh, was an excellent slide. It showed the environmental reasons. It showed the economic reasons. Um, it, you know, it's going to help on workforce housing. It's going to help on so many levels, uh, alleviating congestion, that it is just a no-brainer to, to make sure that we do this. Um, but now we're not going north to south. Now we're going to be going south to north. And uh, to do that, it's going to take a little bit of planning. So today, you're going to hear from uh, Chris Walton, who is our Broward Trans Tra Transportation Director, um, about our Broward's roadmap for the future. You're going to hear from Steve Braun uh, from FDOT talking about the analysis that's going to need to take place to determine stations and, and what the criteria, criteria is for crossing the New River. Um, and then you'll hear from, hear from Vince Ruddy, who will be talking about some of the negotiations and agreements that we'll need to, to uh, go over. But I will say it's just it's an exciting time right now for Broward, uh, particularly since we've got since the surtax was passed. That has just kind of opened the door for us to be able to 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 make this happen. Um, we've been looking. I've been looking at the smart plan, Jimmy. Nice job there, um, and looking at being able to look at the details is very helpful. We're in the middle of putting together our own plan. We're going to call it the brilliant plan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we're a being that right now. We'll see. We'll see what the, how that comes out. Um, but I'm excited about the possibilities for that. Um, you know, we're from FE from fiber optic to the FEC. Uh, this is a, a very exciting time. But I think we all know that it it's gonna it's going to the, honestly the brilliant plan would be when all three of our independent plans get tied together, because what that's going to do is it's going to be connect us all. And writer, you know, we, we, we are gonna rely on having a large ridership 
And any transportation plan has to make sure that it's, it's going to places people want to go and it's getting, getting there. It, uh, people can get there at an affordable price. And by combining all three of our counties, you're, you're, we're going to let our residents get where they're going to get where they want to go at a price that they can afford. And I think that's what we have to offer to each other, all three counties. So next you'll be hearing from Chris Walton, who makes sure that people in our county get from one place to another at a, at a price they can afford. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Chris here. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, I thank Seth Tech for the opportunity to present here. Uh, I guess I'm gonna to talk to you for a few minutes about the, the brilliant plan. Um, <laughs> Just wanted you to know that in March of, of this year, Broward County Transit engaged with a consultant to perform what we call a transit system-wide study. And in this study, in collaboration with the uh, FDOT pd &E study on the FEC quarter, uh, with extensive public engagement, will define the future vision for high-speed or high-capacity transit in Broward County for the next 30 years. Um, now, this study has four major components. Uh, the first uh, element of the, of, the, of the plan will be to, to define and to identify or separate the corridors into what we identify as either, or they identify as bus rapid transit or rail corridors. They're going to, to, to make that separation. If you're familiar with our Surtex plan, it calls for 26 miles of light rail and 150 miles of bus rapid transit on seven quarters. So the first element or, or, or the first task is for our consultant to, to make that separation. And once they do that separation, they're going to rank each of those quarters. And when I say rank them, I mean basically ranking them on FTA, FTA criteria for funding. So the second task will be to take the top rated bus rapid transit quarter we're going to take it all the way to NEPA and all the way through 30% design. Um, and it will identify such, you know, transportation elements along all of the corridors to identify, identify where we should place additional transit investments, such as maybe improved bus service, uh, TODs, parking ride lines. Um, the third element will be take the top rated bus, I'm sorry, the top rated rail segment to through NEPA as well as 30% design. Again, I, I mentioned that we've got uh, 26 miles of light rail, but we don't really know in terms of what comes first and, and our, our, our plan will, will help define it for us. Fourth, uh, because of the magnitude of this program, it is just on the rail side alone, it is over a $4 billion plan. And we recognize that rail is new here in Broward County. So one of the things that we're requiring is for assistance in project management and, and technical support uh, for staff augmentation to, to help guide us through this, this long range process. Um, again, and it's key to, to understand that, you know, this is being done in collaboration with our partners at the Florida Department of Transportation because we recognize that what happens on the FEC is directly uh, related to the, the rest of the rail and high capacity network that we have here in Broward County. So I'm, I want to move to the next slide. So for, for those of you, and I know we've got a number of people on, on the line that because this is relatively new for, for South Florida, outside of Miami-Dade, um, you know, Miami-Dade has had rail for a number of years, but rail in this county, and Broward certainly is new, and for our friends in Palm Beach County, you know, we, we're just going to quickly walk through a, a primer so that you understand what we talk about when we say uh, light rail and the differentiation from light rail to, to heavy rail. Um, and these, these parameters by, by no means absolute because you can find variations in, in the different rail modes. But typically light rail, um, the routes are five to 15 miles and they, they run an average speed of 10 to 30. And they run a little bit slower in the cities because they're, they're operating in mixed traffic at, at civil speeds. And, and station spacing is typically a mile to a mile and a quarter a mile to a quarter mile to a mile and frequencies are 10 to 20 minutes and much faster during, during peak service hours. A commuter rail is what you know the, the focus of, of this uh, session is 
is, is really, uh, I, I think, going to be the game changer for our three counties. Um, I, I think, as has already been stated here, we've got the ideal quarter. Um, I think, you know, when, when you look at the, the number of cities that the FEC bisects on the East Coast, it's a natural real quarter. And I, what we will see on this quarter, uh, or what, what is typically seen in the commuter rail, is that it has what well, historically has been more of a, a, a system that will, like if you look at Miami and some of the other cities where you've got a, a, a central core, and it typically would serve suburban uh, employ, employees coming into the core. Um, ours is more north-south, and we've got a number of, of, of different cities along the corridor, so it'll be a little bit different in that respect. But it will also require a bit wider spacing of stations to allow the heavy locomotives to get up to, to higher average speeds, which typically run between 30 and 50 miles per hour. Station spacing is generally two and a half to five miles, and the, the system frequencies are, are typically around 30 minutes at peak. High speed rail, much different, uh, much longer routes, uh, much higher speeds, and uh, station spacing is much greater, typically 25 miles plus, and frequencies generally are, are an hour apart. Um, I think it's important to note that, you know, what we've identified here in red is that our station locations will consider these specific mode factors in, in when, how we actually evaluate and place our stations as it relates to the commuter rail. Uh, again, as, as I mentioned, none of these are absolutes, but these are generally accepted design principles and practices for, for commuter rail. So with that, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to our partner, um, the Florida Department of Transportation, uh, Steve Braun. Thanks, Chris. Uh, good morning, everyone. And as Chris said, uh, we're a fully engaged partner in, in this with, the, uh, with Broward County. And we appreciate the opportunity really with that partnership. As Chris mentioned too, this project's a, a game changer for the region and obviously for the county. But in addition to the partnership with the county, um, we again, appreciate uh, the opportunity with, to work with all the stakeholders on this call, as well as other stakeholders with a keen interest on this project. And I think previous speakers have covered this timeline, so I'm not necessarily going to go through this. Um, you know, Bill Cross gave an excellent overview of really uh, some of these key milestones in the history of this project. But of note, and, and he had mentioned it in 2014, you know, that, that request to go into project development uh, through FTA at the time was put on hold. And I think for us, the more recent, uh, maybe a smaller game changer was, um, you know, in January of, of, of this year, um, signing that uh, memorandum of uh, understanding with Broward County, uh, defining our role and Broward County's role in, in managing this phase of the project, the project development and environment uh, study. So a lot of those, the history in, in the, that timeline sets the stage for the study. Again, partnership between the department and Broward County. And I'll just spend a few minutes here just talking about the, the roles uh, we're playing uh, with Broward County's roles as well. So again, DOT is leading the PD&E study. We have a, a team of consultants on board um, really uh, engaged in, in, in that management and, and the technical uh, engineering and environmental analysis of commuter rail on the FEC line. Again, one of the primary focuses uh, of, of a project development study is to maintain eligibility for federal funding. And as a lot of uh, speakers have already uh, mentioned, uh, public involvement and in engaging the, the community, stakeholder coordination is a big part of this. So DOT is taking the lead on, on the uh, primary public involvement. And then Broward County, uh, you know, with their relationships at, at the municipal level and at the county level are taking the lead on stakeholder outreach and also outreach related to the station locations. Additionally, Broward County, um, you know, was touched on before as well, the track access um, and, and ultimately the operations and maintenance discussions as well. And funding, I'm not gonna necessarily touch on here. Uh, Vincent will get into that uh, after I present, but that, that's a key element of Broward County's responsibility as part of this study is identifying the financial plan and uh, you know, putting that that approach and strategy together for capital and O and M costs. So again, you know, that long timeline really uh, over a decade of work. But for me, uh, this this slide really uh, uh, 
helps it really identify uh, to all of you truly where we are in the, this process, which we're excited on. You know, steps one and two uh, were outlined in, in, in all those uh, bullets earlier. You know, the, the planning, the overall big picture plan for, for the region, a lot of that work has been done uh, through those previous studies, through those previous efforts, um, as well as even uh, some level of, of technical work uh, that will feed into where we are now, the project development and environment study. And it's exciting in, in the sense of this table where you see the next step really is design and construction. Uh, once we, we hone in on the, the preferred alternative and, and all those agreements that were mentioned. So again, I mentioned the partnership, but uh, other agencies involved, you know, Federal Transit Administration was mentioned before, the lead agency. Uh, and I'll touch on it in, in a second, uh, you know, one of the key elements of the project, as we all know, the crossing of the New River. And so the US Coast Guard uh, is, is a federal cooperating agency. And then across the bottom there, you'll, you'll see all the agencies involved, municipalities, keen interest, obviously, the various MPOs, obviously this group with SEFTEC representing uh, three MPOs, um, key stakeholder as well. And just quickly, the steps below there, um, you know, at the bottom, developing alternatives to meet the needs. We're, we're embarking on that now. We're collecting data, the environmental analysis, the costs, the public engagement, ultimately uh, with a recommendation for a locally preferred alternative. So we, we, we've seen these limits, uh, but I just, just wanted to really just focus on the limits of the Broward County study. And again, the key elements of the study I mentioned, the, the crossing of the New River, uh, identification and recommendations for station locations. And then a key element uh, as well is the east-west traffic analysis for both the, the crossings um, at, at, at railroad and, and roadway crossings, and also at the station locations. Just quickly on, on, on the stations, um, you know, this is from some FTA and, and uh, Urban Land Institute guidelines on, on station identification, transit oriented development. So uh, yeah, I know we're running a little bit late on, on schedule here, so I'm not necessarily going to go through these, but I think the key uh, here is station location, um, looking at land use, economic development, the connectivity, as Chris meant, mentioned, to, to, to that, that broader system plan and some of the previous uh, premium transit routes in that plan. Um, ridership potential at, at different locations and then walkability and connectivity. Um, and, and then obviously parking as well. And then just reiterating Chris's point just on, on kind of the sweet spot of the, uh, uh, the, the station locations, uh, you know, that two and a half to five mile um, distance between stations. I mentioned before the previous studies, one of which was the feasibility study for the New River Crossing, which sets the foundation going into this project development environment study. Uh, this was completed uh, in, in 2020 for the legislature. Extensive stakeholder and agency coordination in, in this feasibility study. Again, key considerations there, uh, marine traffic, freight, and also passenger operations all being maintained uh, at that location uh, and optimizing you know, the mobility of, 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 of those different functions. Um, the existing bicycle bridge for freight remaining. So the, the feasibility study looked at, and you'll see on the right-hand side there, four alternatives, which again, set the, the stage going into this pd &E study of uh, two bicycle bridges, a, a 21 foot and a 56 foot mid-level, an 80 foot uh, high-level bridge, and then also the tunnel concept. So again, this pd &E study, We'll be conducting the, the outreach, the environmental and engineering evaluation of those four alternatives uh, as we move forward into pd &E. So just briefly, our, our project schedule here. Um, yeah, in, in general terms, you'll see there uh, key elements from the, the engagement perspective. We're collecting data now, so we are working with local municipalities and other stakeholders on data collection. And we're on that cusp of, of really getting into the heavy technical analysis to gear up for uh, August of this year, a, a broader public uh, uh, outreach event, uh, what we'll call a kickoff meeting. Um, that evaluation will continue. Uh, and then early next calendar year, a, a public workshop. And at that time, we'll have recommendations that maybe uh, will be presented to the pub public, get feedback, refine those alternatives and, and, and produce the technical documents and some of those agreements that, that need to be in place uh, to move, move forward, the financial plan, access agreements, and so forth. 
so I'll hand off to Vince now. Um, it's been great working with Vince. He, he, he's, he's new at the county, but uh, he's been extre extremely engaged in, in, in this project and we appreciate uh, his role. Vince is gonna touch on the project funding and financing. Uh, thanks, Steve, um, appreciate it. We're running a little bit over time, so I'm gonna try to make this brief and save time and answer questions at the end. But, um, um, you know, the county, as I said earlier, is leading the financial planning aspect of this um, project for the Broward portion anyway. And, um, you know, one of the things on this slide is really, I wanna start from the bottom and go up, really start from the private sector. Uh, we've already heard from Brightline, the leadership there and the investment, there's other investors. Really encouraging to hear that uh, Miami-Dade has received six proposals from developers looking at transit-oriented development around potential stations. Uh, we plan to do similar things here. Our key up in Broward is to move from a more ad hoc approach to the structured um, you know, deals and, and package opportunities, which will be a lot easier to do once we get a little further into the PD&E study. Uh, I saw one of the questions, I believe it was Javier Betancourt, made a really good point about the, the need to consider alternative or, or different modes of financing at the local government level. And he's spot on. We are planning to do that. And to do that, it's going to require uh, leadership by the county and close coordination and leadership with the municipal governments, uh, including the various options listed here, special assessments, uh, TIF funding, joint development. There's the, the area is ripe, these, these new station areas, the whole corridor will be ripe for um, P3 and other uh, alternative delivery approaches. So we're looking forward to um, helping to um, put that together, come up with a game plan and facilitate that process because the more local funding, the more private funding that goes into this, the better we'll be, the, the, the more attractive our uh, proposals, our grant applications will be to the federal government. Um, and as far as the approach is concerned, um, you know, it's as pointed out here, we're gonna need uh, to have a, a highest possible local funding commitment. Um, the, the FTA requires at least 50% funding from local sources in order to achieve just a medium score. And there will be competition, even with the new infrastructure bill, assuming that passes, we assume that there still will be a lot of competition and the need to put forward a, a highly leveraged uh, proposal. Next slide, please. Um, a lot of people think that the penny for transportation, the surtax that would pass, solves all the problems. It actually doesn't, unfortunately. It's, it's positive. It helps improve the prospect, and we're certainly excited to, to, take, to make use of it. But the surtax budget was uh, predicated on 26 miles of LRT, seven BRT corridors, and this particular commuter rail project was not actually included in the original financial plan. Um, we're not gonna be able to sacrifice the east-west connectivity, those other corridors I just mentioned. Um, they're gonna be important. They'll actually increase ridership for the uh, Coastal Link project. So we, we need to make sure we can cover those with the surtax money. And uh, for that reason, as I said earlier, leveraging the counterpart funds from other local governments and private investors will be absolutely essential. Last point on this slide, is the importance of cost-effective approaches. And that's gonna become relevant when we talk about the new river. I know there'll be other presentations on that topic, but um, just to finish, uh, remind everybody that the FTA's cost-effectiveness breakpoints that they use for grant application evaluation, combined annualized capital and operational cost per trip. If it's between $4 and $6, you'll get a medium score. Sorry, $6 and $10, uh, you get a medium score and you, you need to be medium at least to go to the next stage of, of consideration. I think we should be aiming for a medium high score of somewhere between $4 and $6 uh, combined capital and operational cost per trip. And uh, to do that, we're gonna have to be very disciplined and careful not to embrace overly expensive, overly complicated um, technical solutions and design, design solutions. It has to be cost-effective. With that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Commissioner Furr and look forward to questions on the financing side uh, afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. Um, so what, where that leads us at is we have a, a number of decisions we need to make. Um, Patrick had mentioned, you know, it's important to have an engaged partner. And I think what you're seeing here is a lot of engagement, not only by the county, but by FDOT, um, our entire transportation, you know, MPOs, 
but we're, but we're trying to take this as a holistically. Uh, we want to make all the decisions to kind of together because uh, one decision affects another. We are working hard to get the aerial easements. And I think uh, Patrick had mentioned we're, we're getting close to that. Uh, track access fee is going to, going to be dependent on uh, some real estate appraisals as well as how much our investment is. You know, what, how much are we putting in? And that will depend on how, you know, some things like how we get over the or under uh, the new river. Uh, operator selection. I loved hearing what Steve had to say about with, um, with TriRail maybe being one of those partners. Identifying the stations, I think that is fairly imminent. We should be able to, within, I think if I, see, if I saw Steve's timeline, that's probably within a couple of months. And so we're, we're, we're closing in on, on some major decisions that's gonna allow us to, to go forward. I think all of us sense and feel the same sense of urgency knowing that that, uh, you know, that money may be coming down the tracks and we wanna be uh, at the platform to welcome it. Uh, so uh, with that, you know, I'm looking forward to other you know, questions and, and answers. And uh, thank, thanks Chris, Steve and Vince for helping out on this, appreciate it. So th thank you to uh, both sets of panelists. So we just had two very informed presentations, both at different stages in the process. Um, since we have the Broward County folks on, I'm going to ask a question directed to them, and then we'll go towards a much, a much broader one. Um, for, to expand service, we have a question of, do we need to expand the number of tracks that are running along the corridor? That's a question really for Patrick, but my understanding is yes. Yeah, I can, I can elaborate if you like. Uh, so yes, the, the, the existing infrastructure is designed to accommodate 36 passenger trains and up to 24 freight trains uh, running at uh, a certain on-time performance metric. So higher for passenger, a little bit lower for freight. And that's the standard upon which the existing infrastructure has been built. That's what's determined the number of crossovers. That's how the signaling system has been configured. So if you're going to add, you know, and what Jimmy talked about in terms of the schedule plus tri-rail, you know, another 40, 50, 60 trains to that, um, you got to create uh, additional areas where trains can pass each other. Um, you also need to get trains off the main line as much as you can uh, so that if there is an issue or an incident or a problem at a station, you're out of the way. So, so the answer is there essentially, if you dr just dropped in the 50 additional trains to the existing infrastructure, it won't dispatch. You won't be able to run trains on time. You won't be able to run them at their optimum speed or at the maximum track speed. Uh, and therefore capacity needs to be added. We have sort of soft circled somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 million or less in Miami-Dade for that. And I expect that Broward will be in a similar neighborhood minus uh, the bridge. So, you know, assuming it has the same number of stations, you know, five or six stations, um, Broward corridor is a little longer than Miami-Dade. Uh, so there may be a little bit more expense uh, in Broward just because, you know, there's more real estate. Um, um, so that's to be determined once we determine the station locations. And, uh, you know, uh, we have to confirm that they want the same frequency as Miami-Dade County. But assuming that, you know, they're similar, it'll be similar. And then you got to add the bridge to that. Um, and just to explain and touch on it earlier, the New River Bridge is a bascule bridge and uh, is... Uh, unfortunately, you know, we've got very, very tight criteria there with the Marine community and with the Coast Guard to enable the, you know, uh, um, efficient passage of Marine traffic. Uh, so there, we can't just drop another 30, 40, 50 trains, because that would mean that bridge would be closed most of the day. Uh, so we're already at capacity in terms of the amount of times we can close that bridge. And that's why we're looking at a new new river bridge. Um, so, you know, depending on what we build there, that will drive the cost around uh, around that. And that will be additive uh, to the infrastructure needed on the on the existing corridor. 
Thank you. So now this is for all of our panels. We have a lot of questions come up about station location and choosing stations. And these questions have come in from listeners from Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County. And I know that each area might have a slightly different answer because of where it is in the process. Uh, I, so, so if you like, I'll take a crack at it um, because we've been interfacing with both counties and then, you know, would love to have others, um, you know, contribute to that. Obviously, uh, there's a process, uh, a different process happening up in Broward. But, you know, as you all know, this project has been studied for a couple of decades and correspondingly, there are some pretty obvious places where uh, stations need to go. Um, some had been identified in previous studies, some locations had been identified in previous studies. Um, so that was one part of the criteria is like, where, where were we already looking? Where had space already been created for stations and parking? So that was one piece. I think another piece was, you know, is there enough distance between stations? So, you know, are they on top of each other? Is there at least, you know, three miles, two to three miles uh, distance between each station? Um, are we putting too many stations or too few stations? Too many stations will impact travel time negatively, right? Too few doesn't serve enough of the community. Um, then, uh, you know, actual engineering viability of a station. So can we actually locate a station in a place where it's convenient for people to get to, to park and to access the platform itself? Can we fit the platform in the right of way? We're building platforms on both the east and west sides of the corridor. Uh, so we need a wide enough portion of the, uh, and we're building it inside of the right of way. So that has you know, led us to identifying station locations that actually accommodate platforms in addition to two main lines and two sidings. Uh, so that was part of the criteria. And finally, we looked at, you know, from a mobility perspective, what are the important east-west corridors uh, along the corridor that would interface with this system so that if you're, you know, if, if in the future or if presently you're deploying um, either a light rail system that might go to a port or a bus rapid transit system that's running east-west or existing bus systems that are running east-west, um, how could those interface with these stations so we really create an interconnected um, transportation ecosystem? So those are the criteria that we looked at uh, as we studied uh, this with Dade. And then, of course, we conducted a number of community workshops, um, you know, where others got the opportunity to demonstrate. And, and we did ridership studies, right? So like you actually did a ridership study. Um, you know, the preponderance of your ridership for, for, for a system like this are going to originate within two miles of your train station. So we looked at the uh, population density around those stations and those who actually were um, public transportation reliant in those communities, and then how many jobs you were providing access to at that station. So there's a lot of criteria I've listed there. Uh, there's probably a lot more, and they all rank differently in terms of importance. But that's what guided our discussion uh, in Miami-Dade, and that will inform, you know, I think the dialogue that we expect to have with Broward County on, on uh, station locations uh, there. So I, I don't know if anybody wants to add yeah. to that, you know, Vince or Steve or, um, you know, anyone else, but, but that's kind of, uh, I just wanted yeah. to get our perspective. Thanks, Patrick. And, and Paul, like you had said in, in the question, right, we're at different stages, and Patrick just touched on it too. So a lot of the criteria he just mentioned, so, you know, obviously the, the ones I, I'd mentioned in the presentation, those are things we're, we're doing now. Obviously, there, there had been a lot of station discussion in, in the previous studies, um, uh, and, and we'll, we'll pick up a lot of that information, update that, work with the municipalities uh, and the communities, and, and, and really uh, do an analysis based on a lot of the criteria that, that Patrick obviously mentioned. Um, and, and then we'll have recommendations on, on those locations. So similar question, but the other side of that, while this analysis is going on, is there anything that these cities and municipalities can do to help prepare themselves to, to meet these criteria, any sort of first last mile connections that, that can be implemented? What, 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 can, what can be done to really prepare these areas for, for the train? So some of that outreach has already started with the cities. Um, you know, for example, looking at, at what plans they have for future parking or other connectivity and things like that. So um, land use changes, things that, that are 
you know, in motion development, you know, patterns, things like that, that uh, will help us with, with uh, looking at those criteria. But I, I think a key, and, and Chris touched on it, right, the connectivity of those stations to other, other transit routes, other modes, pedestrian access, things like that. So, um, you know, we'll be engaging the municipalities along the corridor for that information and just continue those dialogues. Okay, and we're we're about we're about to touch on this in the next in the next presentation as far as the technicals. But would anybody like to discuss at the high level the New River Bridge and what that connection means for the entirety of the system? Yeah, I mean, I'll take a stab at it. As mentioned, there was a feasibility study completed last year. What it means to the system, and I think Patrick touched on it in his answer to the previous question. Um, yeah, maintaining the, the freight line, uh, the, the passenger service, and then also the marine uh, industry, you know, utilizing the, the, uh, the new river. Uh, so it's important from, from that perspective to understand that, as well as the context of, of downtown and uh, working with the stakeholders, uh, you know, on that front too. I think from an operations perspective, you know, it, it's important to just note that, that all those uh, uses, right, uh, travel through that, that what, what right now it would, it would be a constraint on, on, on the project. Hey, Steve, uh, Paul, can I Paul, I don't know if I, go ahead. Can I just piggyback on what you said? I, I think it's helpful for the broader public to, to remember something they might not know about, which is that of the different options being considered, it's, it's not being proposed to, um, to take the freight rent trains, which are currently much longer and cause a lot more uh, you know, disruption and, and delays uh, on some of the crossings, that will stay on its current bridge crossing of the new river. There's no, my understanding is that the, the options being considered in terms of new bridges and or tunnels were, you know, the idea was not to put the freight through those new options, but to keep it where it currently is. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I think, I think one other aspect of this is the idea that we're probably there's probably going to be a necessity to phase this through Broward County. Um, and, and when I say that, I, I think you'll probably see a southern phase and then a northern phase because that crossing the New River is going to take a while. Um, so there's, you know, I think there's some thought to that as well. So I, I still have some attendees who have their hands raised. I'd like to encourage you to type your questions in the Q&A. And while that's going on, we have a qu question specified to Commissioner Furr. Um, Mr. Harden asked, Commissioner Furr indicated station identification within a couple of months. Is that correct? Well, I'm looking at Steve's timeline. <laughs> Steve, do you want to handle that? No, Commissioner, that, that is correct. Um, you know, the identification, or I'll start back off, right? I think the evaluation the continued data collection analysis of those station locations is important. And, and that decision or that recommendation will be in, in the coming months in the sense of uh, that drives a lot of the other elements of, the, of the, the, the project analysis, right? The operational analysis, the traffic analysis, um, you know, the environmental reviews of those locations. So, and I mentioned before, a lot of legwork has been done uh, leading to this phase of the project. It's really updating a lot of that information and, and, and having a recommendation within months. Um, not to get into too much of the detail, but once we have those recommendations, then we're able to at least um, advance on other steps of the project um, with that understood. Right. So this, is, this will probably be our, our second to last question. Um, Commissioner Andrew McGee of Pompano Beach asked if there's any sort of fair interoperability being explored between SFRTA and Brightline. I'll have a crack and Steve, you can piggyback. I mean, what we're trying to create is a transportation ecosystem. And what we're talking about today are the infrastructure and logistics required to create uh, all of these intermodal solutions for mobility. 
And those are going to be heavy rail, light rail, BRT, buses, rideshare, micro mobility, you name it. And what's going to actually enable a car free lifestyle in this community, in my opinion, is technology. And technology is at a point now where, um, you know, and those of you who are not familiar with mobility as a service, um, really what that is, is the ability to plan pay for and get ticketed for a trip in one place, in one location. That's what is really going to enable a car-free lifestyle in our South Florida community. And I think that there are, and there are a number of companies out there, whether it's, you know, IOMOB or Move It or, you know, there's a handful of others. Uh, Miami Dade Transit has actually been, you know, pretty pioneering uh, as it relates to their technology platforms. There, there, there remains a discussion for us to sit down and talk about how all of these systems are going to work together and how people can easily, you know, plan trips from their home to their final destination that include all the different modalities that a trip might include, because that's where the friction is. That's why people don't take public transportation is because they got to, you know, dig around in their pockets for a crusty, you know, dollar bill to you know, hand over to the bus driver. We got to get away from that. We've got to figure out how to make this a very easy transaction for people. We got to eliminate that friction. So the ability to plan a trip, the reliability of those trips, the cleanliness, the experience that that, that we deliver across all of the different transportation modalities, is that's all critically important. So like the logistics have to be there, the infrastructure needs to be there, the vehicles need to be there, the service levels need to be there, the experience needs to be there, and, and a critical part of that's going to tie all of that together is going to be the technology. So I, I would advocate that at some point, as we advance all of these discussions on getting all of these other pieces in place, that we sit down and we talk about how we enable the technology to be able to uh, uh, connect all of these different systems together. It's feasible, it's already being done. It, the technology exists. We just need to get concurrence amongst us on how we're going to implement it across all of the various systems. We have some solutions, we have some ideas, we have some vendors that we'd love to discuss with others. And from a pricing perspective, then you are able to sell passes, um, you know, our memberships, our other products that give people affordable access to all of these different systems. Now, that said, from a pricing perspective, Brightline is always going to be priced uh, uh, as, a private, as a private operator. We are a for-profit business. We are not in the business of moving people short haul for, you know, and we are not subsidized. Tri-Rail, Metro-Rail, Metro-Mover, whatever we end up doing in Broward, Palm Beach, buses, BRT, those are subsidized uh, systems and they're intended to carry the traveling public uh, uh, whether they have access to a car or not. So, so, and that's what they're designed to do. So pricing wise, Brightline, you know, may put some packages together in conjunction with public agencies uh, that are affordable, um, but you know the Brightline pricing structure is not subject to the same criteria as uh, public agencies are going to be. So, you know, will there be a product that helps connect all of these things together? For sure, the pricing of that will be determined by you know which modalities you're going to use. Just like you know, if you write ride share into that uh, equation, you know, Uber is not going to subsidize their fare. Um, but but you know that that's what what I think we need to work towards. And th thank you, Mr. And Goddard. So if I could jump in just for a second, Paul, because the timing is, uh, the, the commissioner's question is, is very appropriate. Uh, I'll give a shout out to the Broward MPO, which is, has recently offered a grant to SFRTA to coordinate with uh, BCT, uh, Miami-Dade Transit, Palm Tran, which has taken its own initiatives recently. Uh, the technology, as Patrick said, is optimum now that we can handle a lot of these transactions uh, in the cloud uh, so that it, the, the, the coordination can be seamless if someone, a, a rider, uh, is able to uh, use whatever they have uh, on their person. As uh, Clinton Forbes always likes to say, uh, the head of Palm Tran, whether it's getting that dollar bill out of your wallet, but also whether it's uh, a, a card uh, pass or your phone or your wristwatch, whatever you have, to uh, have that uh, uh, that interoperable system, the regional pass. And so we're looking forward to moving that forward with the assistance of Broward MPO. Well, this is Chris Walton at BCT. We should all be aware that that process has really begun. 
Uh, we have been in extensive discussion with Miami Day Trans as well as Palm Tran, and uh, you know we have we've actually come up with a, a regional pass that we hope to debut very very shortly. Um, we we through our our mobile ticketing as well as the technology that uh, Miami Dade has, we we've already identified fair fair structures, and we're just going through the approval process through our boards to actually implement that system. Uh, Palm Tran was a little bit later bringing the technology on board, but they have the exact tech the exact same technology that we do, so we don't anticipate that incorporating them at least into the initial phase of of the bus system network would be an issue. In terms of adding uh, the other, the TNCs and things of that nature, those are in development. And, and Patrick is exactly right. At some point, they all have to come together so that it is actually um, invisible to, to the passenger. They just need to, to go to one app, buy one ticket, and, 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 and ride, ride anybody's system in South Florida. And really, that's where we hit it. But, but the rudiments are already in place. Thank, thank you, Mr. Walton. So I'd like to keep us on time. And I see Mayor Dean Trantalis on deck. So we prepare his presentation. Okay. Mayor, Mayor Dean was elected to the city of Fort Lauderdale in 2018 and was reelected in 2020. He previously served on the city commission representing District 2 from 2003 to 2006 and from 2013 until his ascension to the mayor's office. He represents the city on the Broward Metropolitan Planning Organization, the County Tourism Development Council, the Broward Workforce Development Board, and the Florida League of Cities, and the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mayor Trantalis, for joining us today. Hey, good morning, and thank you for having me. Uh, who's that handsome devil on the slide there? It must be my evil twin. <laughs> so uh, um, I want to thank you all for inviting me here this morning because uh, I think it's important for Fort Lauderdale to you know, certainly be a part of the continuing discussion regarding the, the coastal link. Wanting to achieve uh, greater options for, uh, for mass transit has always been a goal for our, our community and I know South Florida. And the idea of a coastal link, honestly, just a couple of years ago, we thought was, uh, was a pie in the sky dream. But now that all these stakeholders are participating in this discussion, um, we're excited to see something come of this as each city tries to uh, become a part of it, especially some of the smaller cities that are looking for station stops. And, uh, and the idea of adding more trains to the train line to, to uh, accommodate uh, passengers uh, is, is, a wel is welcome news because uh, anyone who's going on uh, I-95 or any of the uh, other uh, other major roadways know for sure that we need to add the, this coastal link to our uh, Southeast uh, Florida region. So as part of that discussion, um, and I know many of you have, uh, uh, have, uh, have heard me before, so some of this is gonna be a little bit uh, redundant, but I come to the, to the table to discuss some of the options that we have here in trying to accommodate this coastal link. Um, uh, adding, I don't know, maybe 35, 40 more trains per day uh, to the existing uh, travel routes are certainly gonna frustrate a lot of the east-west uh, um, travel, such as the vehicular travel on, on Sunrise Boulevard, Broward Boulevard, and Davie Boulevard, and as well as on the New River, oh, I, I totally frustrating the uh, upstream industry that is uh, such a, an important part of our community. Um, and we're very concerned about um, how adding those trains, well, the, the, with the best of intentions, is certainly uh, going to produce unintended consequences, which uh, we're going to look to avoid. So um, as this discussion continued, um, the Florida Department of Transportation suggested that um, uh, we consider a bridge. And, uh, um, and we looked at the, uh, the options of a bridge. And, uh, and I've looked at bridges throughout the country and throughout the world and just felt that um, putting a bridge through the city of Fort Lauderdale would certainly have a lot of consequences, which, which we are not willing to accept. For example, you know, the train tracks alone create a divide through the city that this city has suffered through many, many decades of separation of demographic populations that we're trying to overcome and trying to bring Fort Lauderdale into one community. To build a bridge would further cement that division between those who live on this side of the tracks and those who live on the other side of the tracks. Also, it, it cuts right through our redevelopment area. We have um, major 
new construction taking place right along the railroad tracks. And to build a bridge would, would uh, place this, uh, this structure right up against many of these new structures, including a new government center that we're looking to build right there, just south of the Bright Line Station. So um, a bridge is just not an option in our, in our minds. So we've been uh, um, trying to see if uh, we could con consider other options, uh, such as a tunnel. And uh, the first response we got from the De Florida Department of Transportation was, uh, was certainly um, uh, jarring, to say the least, being told that if we wanted a three-mile tunnel, we would have to, uh, we would have to uh, consider spending a billion dollars a mile. Uh, I went and looked around myself. I spoke with a number of uh, 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 contractors who, who build tunnels throughout the world, and they thought that those numbers were totally out of whack. Um, in the meantime, we've now spoken with uh, the Boring Company. The Boring Company has come to Fort Lauderdale. We've been out there to Las Vegas and to uh, Los Angeles where they have, uh, they've begun some, uh, some tunneling uh, projects. And, uh, and that trip included um, uh, folks from the FEC Railroad. It included folks from the county, uh, myself, uh, our staff, and uh, uh, we all went out there to check it out. I think we came back with some uh, a realization that, that putting a tunnel through the city uh, to uh, bring the tracks below grade is a very, very viable option. In fact, uh, it's probably less expensive than building a bridge. And um, uh, I know we've looked at all the, the different levels, the 24 foot bridge, the 56 foot bridge and the 80 foot bridge. But the reality is that it's still a bridge and, um, and it would cut right through the city and, um, and I think that what we're learning now going forward is that tunnel design is actually a, a concept that we need to incorporate in other things as well. For example, uh, having spoken with the Boring Company, we're now considering putting a tunnel between the, uh, the area of the Brightline Station and Fort Lauderdale Beach, completely eliminating all the, uh, the traffic and the encounters one would have trying to get to the beach by putting a tunnel right through Las Olas Boulevard from one end to the next. Uh, and, and, and these are options and these are opportunities that not only my city, but other cities are looking into as a result of the boring technology that, uh, that the boring company has now been able to create, bringing the cost of these projects to a fraction of what were originally anticipated. So for example, we're looking at a train tunnel uh, that would probably cost somewhere between 200 and $250 million for a three mile tunnel, um, which is uh, significantly less than the billion dollars a mile for that we were, we were told by Florida Department of Transportation. So we're happy to work with all the stakeholders to see how we can make this happen. But the reality is this is the 21st century. We need to start looking in a three dimensional pattern, not just, uh, not just thinking that you know, we need to keep the same um, approaches as the only options that we have here in terms of trying to build our cities. Whatever we do today is going to impact the next hundred years, the generations to come. So we have to do it right the first time in order to be able to build the city in a way that is sustainable and makes sense for the community and those who are going to take the passenger rail. Uh, we think it will enhance the rail system. We think it will improve the productivity of the rail system. And we also think that uh, ridership would be uh, um, would be appreciative of the fact that you know there we'll be able to avoid a lot of uh, a lot of instances that could happen if we kept the uh, the, the this rail system at, at uh, grade level. So um, so we're excited about the opportunity. We're excited about uh, continuing our dialogue with uh, with the Boring Company. Uh, we're probably going to make an announcement uh, soon as to a, a as to a, a tunnel um, that is not related to the tracks, but is the La Solis tunnel that I just described. And, uh, uh, but we understand that there's more to it uh, in building this train tunnel, but we're very, very pleased to be able to work with all the stakeholders to make this a reality because we really feel that this is the way to go. And my commission is in agreement with that. And, uh, and I believe that the majority of the county commission is also um, uh, in agreement with this approach. So, so you know, I appreciate being able to speak to the folks today and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mayor Trantalis, for that enlightening presentation. So now we're moving on to our penultimate speaker, 
Nick Yuren. He's the executive director for the Palm Beach Transportation Planning Agency. He has been in that position for the past eight years. Nick works for 21 locally elected officials to collaboratively plan, prioritize, and fund the transportation system for the 1.5 million people of Palm Beach County. The T Palm Beach TPA annually allocates over $650 million to projects and services that advance the vision of a safe, efficient, and connected multimodal transportation system. Nick Uren, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Paul. And thank you everyone for persevering this long. Um, I think the participation in this workshop has been fantastic. I'm gonna to touch on as a closing the Northern end of the region. And if we can jump to the next slide, I do wanna mention several people have said, hey, how does this work? Why isn't it a regional corridor? Click one more time, and just highlight the uh, FEC line, I believe, right. So we, what I wanted to say is this is a regional transit system that we are seeking to advance. There, there are a lot of discussions that occur at the county level because that's where a lot of our funding for transit investments is derived. But we are working collaboratively with all of the partners and it's exciting to have five transit agencies on this slide. We've got Palm Fan, MDT, BCT, We've heard from TriRail and we also have Brightline. And so it's really a public private partnership that we are working on. And we're trying to do this all collaboratively to, to serve our, our shared constituents, our shared customer base. If we can jump to the next slide. I uh, want to talk briefly about some of the things that have already been happening or are upcoming in the Palm Beach County portion of the region. Uh, we're going to touch on the Northwood crossover. We're going to talk about what Brightline is currently doing in, in Palm Beach County. For those of you who think Brightline is, is sitting on their haunches because you're in Broward and uh, Miami Dade, that's far from true. The activities are phenomenal. The work that they're doing is excellent. And then some things that we uh, are in discussion on. And so we'll go to the next slide. Just as a reminder, for those who are unaware, we, we do have these two parallel railway tracks, the South Florida Rail Corridor, which is owned by the DOT and the FEC Corridor, which is a privately owned railway. And there is a connection in uh, West Palm Beach, the Northwood crossover was recently completed by DOT, which is an excellent con construction uh, facilitating interaction between the two quarters and allowing for extension of uh, trains that are operating on the Tri-Rail Corridor to get into Northern and Eastern Palm Beach County. Uh, also connects to the Brightline layover facility. So we've got access to both corridors and some of their key infrastructure investments. The uh, tri-rail layover facility that's going to be constructed in the near future is just to the northwest of here. Uh, and that was a great example of a public-private partnership because we had contributions from both the railways, the uh, federal government, the state government, and even some SFRTA uh, funding. If we can jump to the next slide. The, Right line double tracking is happening right now on the existing FEC line between West Palm Beach and Cocoa. And it, just like you recall, a couple of years ago in Southeast Florida, most of the crossings were under construction. There was lots of activity in the corridor. Um, all of that's happening in Northern Palm Beach County right now. The 26 rail crossings in Northern Palm Beach County are being upgraded also to establish the ability to designate the uh, corridor as a continuous quiet zone and the TPA as a funding partner. Uh, for that effort. And, and I guess one of the things I want to mention, and I just want to give as much recognition as I can to the Brightline project, is I, I had the opportunity to drive to Orlando yesterday on the 528 corridor. The investment in rail infrastructure on the south side of the 528 corridor is unprecedented. It, it's literally something I, I didn't expect to ever see in my lifetime. It, it brought a tear to my eyes of driving along the corridor thinking We've never made an investment in America in high-speed passenger rail like what is being constructed along the 528 corridor. They're actually pursuing or have, have obtained permission to construct it as a, uh, as a class seven track, which means there can be no grade separate or no grade crossing, no at grade crossing along the entire corridor. So that allows them to get up to that 125 mile per hour speed. The construction that overpasses the tunnels, it's it's phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal, the private investment in mobility that's being made here in Florida. And I, I just wanted to make sure that we sing the praises of that decision, that process that has resulted in this opportunity for connectivity in Florida. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Boca Raton Station, we've had a lot of talk about this as an example of what cities can do to position themselves for additional passenger rail service. Uh, two points I want to make sure that people are understanding. First is the stations that, that are being serviced by the Brightline's um, 
right? The Brightline trains are not cheap. They're $46 million. In this case, I believe Aventura is priced at about $60 million. In this case, it was a public-private partnership. Brightline contributed $20 million. The city's contribution was in the form of land. And a key component of that land was a continuously uh, accessible frontage along the railway that was at least a thousand feet long. So as all of you cities are thinking, we have space for a station, keep that 1000 foot length in mind. That's the kind of distance that the uh, rail service is looking for in order to be able to designate your portion of the corridor as a stop. The city also contributed $10 million toward the construction of that station. And then the city and Brightline were able to partner together on an application for a discretionary federal grant, the Chrissy Grant, and they were awarded $16 million to fully fund the construction of that project, which, which is expected to commence later this year. Uh, next slide. There, there's been discussion of a potential Palm Beach Garden station. I, I'll acknowledge that the primary discussion has been on the side of the city at this point, but the city has included it in their adopted mobility plan. And we've also included that station in the TPA's long range transportation plan, making it eligible for various federal and state funding resources. Um, city has also adopted a mobility fee, which allows them to capture some contributions from new development as they are permitted within the city. And that can be used as a potential capital funding source for the, uh, for the construction of a station. The city has approached Brightline about this proposed station. It's about nine miles north of uh, the West Palm Beach station. And so it, it's a little bit shorter distance than what is the, uh, the established target for the interim or infill stations in Boca and Aventura. Uh, and Brightline hasn't made any agreements to this at this time, but it's certainly something that uh, the residents of Northern Palm Beach County are interested in as a potential quick hit introduction of additional rail service in the Northern part of Palm Beach County. And let's go to the next slide. And ultimately, I think what we've heard is that conversations are advancing rapidly in Miami-Dade County and they're advancing rapidly in Broward County. And part of the reason for that, not the entire reason, but part of the big reason for that is that both of those counties through their voters have chosen to collect a transportation surtax that allows them to have locally designated or designated local funding to advance projects and provide capital and operating dollars for projects like this. So one of the key next steps in Palm Beach County is to facilitate and continue the discussion about whether we want to follow, follow suit. And I've noted here on this map of Florida, Hillsborough County had established a, a transportation surtax. It was just uh, repealed by the uh, state Supreme Court, but I expect them to continue that conversation and, and to pursue a uh, redesignation or re-implementation of that surtax in the future. Orange County put that conversation on hold in 2020, but I expect them to pursue it again in either 22 or 24. Pinellas County was uh, on track in 2020 and postponed the discussion in, uh, in light of the pandemic, but they expect to pursue that again in 24. And the conversation for Palm Beach County as we seek to integrate ourselves within the region is, are we ready for that discussion? If so, what are the implementation steps that we need to take and what is the timeline for putting that in front of the voters so that we can have a designated local transportation funding source that can allow us to advance things like FEC commuter rail, uh, proceeding into project development, design and ultimately construction and implementation. And I think that's going to wrap up my component of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uren. So we're about to wrap up. We have a few minutes left for some questions. We have about six unanswered in chat. Um, Mr. Simon, I see that Nick responded to you, to you, per, to you personally. Um, I guess overall, since we're, we're coming at the end of this and the transition, how do we see ourselves teeing up for federal funding? Just overall, or is this a, is, is this a question that's gonna be take more than two minutes to answer? Well, if I'm the last speaker, I can give it a shot and then we can let the folks to the South supplement my response. But I think the, the primary way to do that is to know what you wanna build and to have local funds to put forward as a match for any requested federal assistance. So if the Biden administration expands the menu of options, the opportunity for earmarks or the discretionary funds available through a capital incentive grant or a capital investment grant through the FTA, the counties that to the south that have local funding available to pledge as a matching 
for construction are going to be well positioned to secure those dollars from the federal government. I, I'll just add to that with what Nick's saying. We have to know exactly what we're asking for. We have to know where those stations are. We have to know how we're uh, traversing the river. And the, with, without answers to those questions, we can't go much further. So those decision points are urgent um, and we need, to, we need to make decisions. And um, this, uh, this is Jimmy Morales here in Miami Day. When one of the challenges is, in the con uh, and Patrick and I have shared this frustration on conversations is that FTA is, being, is very cautious about and warning, you know, don't enter into uh, binding commitments. Don't get too committed early on. And yet, you know, obviously there's a dedicated line here to, you know, that we're not talking about building or buying right of ways or things like that as a dedicated rail line. And we have to deal with the person and we want to deal with the entity that, that has the easement there. And uh, they're, they're critical to making those determinations of where the stations are, what's going to cost and whatnot. And how do we walk that fine line of going far enough to give bright line comfort that something's going to happen and, and getting all the information we need but not going so far that we, we jeopardize uh, the federal dollars. It's a it's a quite a tightrope, and right? we're sort of walking it right now, uh, but it's not easy. So that that being said, we have about a dozen speakers on here. We have another two hundred people in chat with, or sorry, in viewing this with an interest in this. Many municipalities, hundred miles of rail. How do we get everyone together, uh, rowing in the same in the same direction? What what does that look like? Well, I do think Ceftech is the, is is a good place to to begin. It is the one formal place where we can have this conversation uh, for all three counties. And to that to that end, you know, when we're talking, we earlier we were talking about rail passes that traverse all three counties. You know, to, to have that seamlessness, you have to have a conversation and a formal structure to be able to you know do those things. And I think we're doing that. I know I heard Chris. Uh, mentioned earlier, it, that was a recommendation of Ceftec earlier. We have to, you know, when we, my concern, and, and I, don't, I don't know if Dean is still on here or not, but big questions like figuring out the bridge or the tunnel, that has, you know, we're, we're going to need help with, from, I, I think, from FDOT um, to help us to determine, you know, what's, what's really um, viable and what's not, and what are the real costs. Um, or we need help in, in figuring out the best, best way to approach that. Without those answers, I don't know how we go forward. Hey, uh, Beam, can I piggyback on your suggestion, which is a good one, and just say that, um, you know, I agree that CEFTEC is a good forum to kind of bring stakeholders together and coordinate on such a uh, regional um, initiative uh, I think that Ceftec, you know, I don't know, I, I haven't looked at your website recently or whatever materials you have, but I believe there's quite a bit of confusion out there about because of the complexity of this project and um, providing information that kind of distinguishes between tri rail and this, um, you know, coastal link project that is being called that makes it clear, you know, who the players are, what their current roles are, and potential future roles. Like it's, you know, people talk about bright line as if it's going to run the service and, and Patrick made it very clear that they're agnostic about whether or not they're going to run it. There's offers from tri-rail on a bright line may or may not be willing to do it. Um, making it clear to the public that there's decisions like that, like the operator that still haven't been made and just making sure that they can see, you know, maps like the one you have up on the screen now that show that this is a corridor parallel and very close to an existing corridor that tri-rail is currently running operations on, but with different characteristics. Um, I think in particular though, the one final suggestion I'll make is the expectations uh, at the municipal level with local government about their ability, the potential for a station in their jurisdiction, their vicinity, it has to be tempered. And I think we all need to, if we're gonna be talking about commuter rail, um, make sure we're, we, we remind people that this is not a you know light rail project, it's not, uh, bus rapid trend. It's not the kind of things that accelerate and decelerate so quickly that you could have stations right next to each other, a half mile or, or less, or 
at that level. So making sure people understand that it's this is not the only transportation mode that, that will benefit them as part of the broader county plans that are being developed, whether it's smart plans or, or Broward's um, upcoming plan, and just getting that information out so that people will make informed decisions and uh, contribute to the, the stakeholder engagement process in uh, constructive ways. And thank you, Mr. Ray. So Mr. Vitale, want, want, I'm going to give him the last comment yeah. before we transi transition to the closeout. Thank you, Paul. And um, Vince, looking forward to working with you. Congrats on the new role. I want to, I want to add to what Vince just said. You know, in, in Broward County, there seems to be a lot of parts. And perhaps the, the way to suggest uh, a path forward would be, uh, and this kind of came up through the, one of the questions in, in the chat, is to get some type of uh, MOU in place, a memorandum, memorandum of understanding as to who has roles and responsibilities. Because if you're in this business, this topic deeply, then you have a, a clear understanding as to who does what and you know all the acronyms and this is a plan or this is in place or this is a historical study, et cetera. But the vast majority of the people have no idea whether that's an elected official or even less so the business community. And so, um, uh, Commissioner Fur, I would, you know, I know the county's been taking a strong lead on this, but maybe there's a way for for a larger group to have a, an MOU in place where we kind of divide up responsibilities and engage some of the business groups as well, not just the workshop, but other groups as well. So that would be a suggestion as a takeaway for next steps. And Randall, Randall, just you know, there is there are MOUs out there right now with um, with Brightline. Um, and with uh, FDOT that are that are kind of dealing with most of the things, but I I, I think your suggestion is a good one, if and where we can do that because uh, the business community has a huge role in this. So absolutely, uh, the one Paul, can I ask one last question? It's, it's your your meeting, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. Um, and this is to Steve and Steve and I. You know, I, if this needs to wait offline, that's fine. But we, you know, the, the question I had about the New River, uh, and I know that is part of the study that you're looking at, um, that is going to be looking at that. Is there anything that you need from, from either Broward or from Ceftec or from any of the MPOs uh, that would help on that? Because it's, it seems like we need a combination of engineers and value, engin you know, value engineering, all that kind of stuff to know what is really possible. Um, it, how, how can how can we help on that or is uh, that totally in? go ahead commissioner thanks you know for putting that that out there and you know you had touched on it earlier right a big part of this partnership uh, and it's in our mou you know between the department and the county is the the technical expertise right that the, the dot um, is committing to this project um so I, I think part of this evaluation that goes into the project development and environment study is looking at multiple alternatives. As I mentioned before, we have several alternatives that, that are at least the starting point for that technical evaluation. Uh, we have been working closely with, uh, you know, the mayor mentioned um, his staff uh, attended a, a forum uh, you know, hosted by the city with the Boring Company. Uh, we have reached out through the city and directly to the Boring Company for, for some information to better understand the technology and, and, and um, and, and so forth. So I, I think we're still, again, in that data collection phase, uh, again, working with the city. Um, and, you know, I, I think at a future point, we'll take up your offer and really reach okay. out uh, through these respective stakeholders and uh, talk through, you know, the, the, the approach uh, at, at the New River. Uh, and I think part of that was really just trying to get, a, a, as I mentioned, just a better understanding of the boring company technology and uh, the potential you know, for, for other uses. The mayor mentioned, um, and, and the boring company interaction that I had uh, at that forum, there was a lot of discussion on first and last mile connections, right? C connections, you know, two stations right. b between hubs, things like that. So, you know, it, it's interesting really just to, to think about that maybe as a much more uh, bigger picture transportation option so, as well. So, so thank Th th thank you, Steve, for answering the commissioner's question. And so today we've heard from many speakers that are all talk talking about their section, but everybody's come back to what 
I think is the most important part, which is this regional planning, this regional collaboration. And that's what I'd like to invite Ms. Eileen Boucle to bring us home with is a brief discussion on that. And what we might actually end up doing is because we haven't really expanded on the regional coordination is do a follow up to this in about another six months at another CEFTEC meeting, just a status check on where we've come from here and where we're going. So now I'd like to queue up the slides for Ms. Boucle, who's the executive director of Miami-Dade Transportation Planning Organization. She joined the agency in 2016 and has helped provide mobility choices for the residents of Miami-Dade County through her local transportation planning process, and more specifically, the Strategic Miami Area Rapid Transit Plan, the SMART Plan, an infrastructure program of projects that aims to significantly improve transportation mobility in Miami-Dade County and the South Florida region. Ms. Boucle, please bring us home. Well, good afternoon. It was a pleasure uh, listening to all of the speakers and uh, really participating in this engaging discussion. I agree that we're ending this discussion with a, a highlight and focus on how we can continue our regional efforts uh, in unifying and pursuing funding at the federal level, state level, also our public private partners, which have been at the table today, our business sector, which have also been at the table today. Uh, there is a slide that I've been asked to um, show everyone that I will ask to be put up, which is basically the funding opportunities. But before I, I walk you through these, um, I would like to comment on the issue of that um, regional coordination and how is it that we can accomplish that and how we can uh, do a better job there. And I, I'd like to tell everyone that even though in Miami-Dade County, we have what we call the SMART plan, when we meet regionally as SEFTEC and work collaboratively as a region, Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade, we refer to the plan as the SMART region because four of our six corridors, including this one, is truly regional and goes not only up to Broward um, and uh, three of the four go up to Broward, but also the fourth one reaching all the way to Palm Beach and also down south to Monroe County. So it's not just a SMART plan, it's a regional plan. And in order to make avail ourselves to any of the opportunities in front of us in terms of federal funds, my answer to that is we have to be in the federal pipeline. We have to be in the federal process. All of the discussions today, all of the partnerships today are critical, but if we're not putting our, our components and our phases and our projects officially in the federal pipeline, we cannot pursue these various funding opportunities that all that not just myself, but my colleagues in Broward and Palm Beach are closely monitoring. So the slide that I've been asked to um, discuss briefly is basically the funding opportunities overview at the federal level, um, starting with the president's Build Back Better plan, which includes 621 billion in transportation infrastructure and resilience. Um, most of you are familiar with the capital investment grant programs in USDOT. The budget request currently pending for fiscal year 2022 is a 23% increase from last year's fiscal 2021 program. And last year, uh, the uh, total amount was approximately $2 billion. And that those funds remain available in, so, until September of 2024. And essentially, the, the $2 billion uh, umbrella is broken down into the next bullet, the New Starts program, of which 1.2 billion is dedicated to the Federal Transit Administration New Starts Capital Program at the federal level. Uh, 525 million are for core capacity projects, which are available to all three counties as a region. 200 million is set aside for the Small Starts Capital Program, and 100 million is dedicated to expedited project delivery. I'm moving on to the infra grant program. This was a discussion that was taking place earlier at the regional level. Um, we had a, an opportunity to apply for just under $1 billion, approximately $900 million worth of infra grants. Those applications were due in March and we discussed them locally at the, the county level, but also collectively at the regional level to see what might be eligible. Uh, what we're currently looking at is the second to last bullet, which is the raise 
uh, um, capital grant program, formerly known as BUILD. It's approximately $1 billion in available for capital investment opportunities um, up through July 12th. And what's interesting about this particular grant program is that they're looking for projects of local and regional impact and significance, and which our project that we focused on today is clearly has a regional impact. So we can see a lot of our smart plans, smart region projects actually fall into certain categories of these federal funding um, uh, programs. In addition, there are opportunities at the state level, as was mentioned earlier, the state has a the counterpart to the new start, small start component and um, is um, does offer opportunities for participating in one half the non federal share if in fact we are in the federal pipeline and following the federal process. And last but not least are the CERT tax allocations, uh, which was placed here on the slide for the purpose of reminding us that as a region, our local investment really is what signals our local funding commitment and local investment really signals to the state and federal partners where our priorities are, because without our local commitment at the table, we really can't leverage or seek the state and federal funding partnerships, which we are so highly focused on. And at this time, I'd like to just conclude my comments. I think the workshop that we've had today has been outstanding. Many topics have been covered. I welcome an opportunity to continue engaging on, on, on not just this project, but the other regional uh, projects that we'd like to pursue and any questions or discussions, I'll be happy to stay in the chat room and continue. Thank you so much and appreciate everybody's um, participation today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bouclay. And while those questions are rolling in, uh, Mr. O'Reilly, if you'd like to say a few, a few words while we sort, sort through our questions. Well, I'm really happy to be here, Paul. I appreciate it. Uh, like some people said earlier, I've been here for the long haul. I've been involved in this project since, since I think it's inception. Uh, I, I, I would like to say a couple of things. I'm deeply involved in the project. Uh, and we said back several years ago, it kind of collapsed a little bit under its own weight. Uh, Miami Dade and, and Brightline are to be congratulated for getting this revised and getting so close in Miami Dade County. I really urge them to go as fast as they can. And, and Broward, you know, we're, we're involved with that to do our best to catch up. Um, we will work closely with the community, with the business folks in Broward as the Broward effort keeps on going as quickly as it can. Um, a lot of the work has been done. We need to do the outreach. We need to solve the crossing at the new river and how that's done. We have the technical horsepower on our team to do that. If they're not there, we will bring them in either nationally or internationally or, or, or whatever is needed. Um, and we need to solve that. And we need to solve that, that crossing. And I think we will do that in the next coming months. And then we all need to work towards getting that implemented. But this project, for our Miami-Dade County are so close to the finish line. They've applied for federal grants. They're practically there. Uh, so that's great. I don't want to take any backward steps or anything that could stop them or slow them. And, and then we need to do as quick as we can to catch up in Broward. And uh, Palm Beach County are there waiting, ready to go as well. So that's all great. So I think we're getting closer than we ever have. Uh, and let's all work together and make sure we make that progress to get to the finish line. Well, thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Um, I don't see any new any new questions in the Q and A, but if the panelists would like to stick around for a little bit, we'll keep this open for a little for a little while longer. Uh, we can end the recording. Uh, at one point, we peaked at two hundred and thirty four participants. Um, we're down to one hundred and eighty two, so I'm glad that everybody stayed on for these two and a half hours to talk about one corridor. It was very exciting. So and. With that, everybody have a great weekend and we look forward to seeing you in six months for an update. Once again, thank you to all our panelists, everyone who stuck around and, and all of staff on the back end. We really appreciate everybody's hard work in bringing this together. Thanks, Paul, nice job. Thank you, Paul. Are we staying on? Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.